Sleepy town settling for the night Where the Owens women live their lives And it's about time that the back porch light Comes on At that house down the street At that house on Magnolia Street. There we go. Uh, oh my god, what is Meet me in the middle. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Gotta get all the fucking anxiety <laughs> out. We have so much going on. <laughs> Getting hot. Thinking Getting warmed up. up. Getting hot thinking about I, it. I already sweat through my shirt earlier. I was not wearing this 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Dude. Oh man, did you sweat like you did when I was trying to give you that vocal lesson? Dude, I was sweating. <laughs> you were drenched. I don't think I've ever seen anybody perspire that much in like five seconds. I, did I tell you, I marked you after I had done the vocal warm ups in the art center also, right? And I was like, I'm kind of dizzy. <laughs> Just yeah. like inhaling and controlling it and like breathe, learning to control your breathing like quickly. Yeah. Um, the last time I felt like that was like um, a meditation thing we did where you hyper oxygenated your blood. Yeah. Basically, you're like almost hyperventilating, but you're like controlling it. <laughs> And there's so much yeah. oxygen going through your blood <laughs> oh that God. your body starts to like tense up and you get these like T-Rex hands. It was the wildest experience I've ever done. And I, it, you're supposed to process all the, you know, the trauma and everything, which I did. But I just remember like your body kind of like tenses up. You're you're like in rigor mortis. It's weird. <laughs> you were making me laugh when you were like, yeah, I was like, you were, you were like multitasking vocal lessons and mowing your lawn. I'm like, what the fuck? Have you seen the video, the TikTok video, the girl gets on some kind of like wobbly board that like shakes her around and she's like, she does the vocal thing standard and she's like, okay, now I need to be able to do exactly that while my body is being like yeah. moved around and yeah. be able to roll and not sound like a maniac. Yeah, some vocalists, I think, was it Lady Gaga when she was training to do the Super Bowl the halftime you know how like much she was running around and shit like all performers running around on a stage that big like you really have to be in shape to be able to sing and dance and move around like that that reminds me of Fergie doing the like front hand flips oh my god <laughs> remember wait, wait, wait. yes my brother sends this clip to me all the time just <laughs> randomly because it's so freaking funny all right if you read the comments I think either on TikTok or Instagram where I saw it, if you read the comments, everybody's like, she was that hopped up at 8 a.m. She was that hyper at 8 no a.m. Shit. The morning wow. show. What was she doing doing that on a morning show? Whoa. <laughs> Whoa. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, funny. Yes, yes, yes. You know, now we have to link that because nobody's gonna know, <laughs> nobody's gonna know what we're talking about. <laughs> Uh, yes, right, I perspire very, very easily. Let's just take a collective breath. Okay, ready? We're going to inhale. Into our stomachs? Yes. <sighs> okay. All right. I feel a little more centered now. We were coming in too hot there. We got. We need to scale it back a little bit. We get the we, gas up to 11. We have to manage our stamina because this episode is, this feels like a marathon. <laughs> <laughs> This episode feels yeah. like a marathon. Getting this episode ready felt more like a sprint, right? Like <laughs> we had the time. We had the time. I think we were both kind of just like a little put off by the content. Not put off, but just like dreading it because we weren't finding much. It shifted. Initially, yeah. what you guys are seeing when this comes out on the first mm -hmm. is was labeled as Princess Sybil of Cleve, which we'll get to much later. Yeah. We changed it because as you'll see, Finding stuff on Princess Sybil of Cleve, it's a, it, there was not a lot. But <laughs> this morning, Justina hadn't looked at these notes yet. She was going to, but then she kept going to get cold brew. She kept going <laughs> to the bathroom. And I knew this morning when she looked at them, she would find something to expand on. And as soon as she started typing, I was like, click. Uh -huh. All right, this episode just took a turn for what you're seeing now. 
Yeah. So. By the way, I just want to apologize in retrospect for being the queen of last minute, but I work so much better under pressure. <laughs> Apparently. If you give me like a week, I'm like, yeah, I'll get to it. I'll get to it. But like you give me like five minutes, I'm like, burr, 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 burr. <laughs> I was that kid in, in school that like did the homework like five minutes before class time. Unreal. And risked getting detention if the teacher saw me doing it before class time. I was that kid. Yeah. Unbelievable. So we're talking about Princess Sybil of Cleves. S on the end? I think so. But not only that, we have so much more as you can see from the title. Yes. This is going to be all about the portraits that hang within the Owens residence. Yes. I think this was one of the ones that Daisha picked when we gave her like the option to, we just threw her some That feels topics. like a lifetime ago. I know. It does feel like a lifetime ago. We did so much in between that, but uh, that this was a request by uh, one of our patrons and this is what she wanted. She wanted to hear about this portrait, but as Christina said, we weren't finding much on it. So we had to expand on it a little bit. So we're not just talking about Princess Sybil of Cleves. We're going to talk about all of the portraits you see throughout the movie and there's you know some portraits are talked about in the book a little bit which we'll get to a little later on but yeah i'm excited to talk about the artwork because both me and christina have art backgrounds so Indeed. it's gonna be fun when to reminisce about our experiences with that a little bit dude art history class was chaos yeah <laughs> like, can you imagine a room full of me's <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> trying to memorize 40 we had to remember we'll get there yeah we'll get there but anyway i'm christina i'm drinking my coffee i'm justina <laughs> Hey, everybody. Welcome to Magnolia Street, your one and only fandom for Practical Magic, the movie and the books. We love Alice Hoffman to pieces, and you can visit us here every Friday for new episodes. Yeah. Today we're doing portraits. Watch in Practical Magic World. But before we dive into that, we have some business to take care of, right? Okay. We got some shout outs. Okay. Um, so the first shout out that we have comes from an Instagram follower, listener that we didn't know we had. And it's always nice when you guys tag us and stuff because then we find out about you and we could shout you out on the podcast i'm not sure if this is the same person but i think there's a shell that comments on our youtubes also okay you not sure if it's the same person okay but take it away all right so shell home if it's if that is you commenting on the youtubes let us know so we just have some context <laughs> yeah so an instagram user by the name of shell home um she recently posted a reel to her instagram of a beautiful and that's an understatement beautiful oh crocheted blanket with the house and the scenery from Practical Magic. It's got a little crescent moon, I think, on it and also a little black kitty cat, which oh, is really cat. cute. And, and then it also has like the leaves in yeah, the corner. I have never seen anything like this. I didn't know you could do that it's with beautiful. fabric art. Right. It's beautiful. Yeah. So in her caption, she wrote moonlit wisteria overlay mosaic crochet PDF pattern designed by me inspired by <gasps> Dun da da da! Magnolia Street Podcast. Wow. Um. Thank awesome. you. That's. Yeah. I'm honored to be able to inspire anybody to create stuff this beautiful. Yeah. Oh, um, amazing. Yeah. I don't think the blanket is for sale, but if you do crochet, you can actually buy the pattern to make your own version of this blanket on her Etsy shop, and her link is home. H O L M made treasures like homemade treasures so cute dot etsy.com and her instagram handle is homemade treasures so if you'd like to check out her blanket masterpiece go over to her link give her a little comment tell her that she did an amazing job and it's so nice to meet you virtually and uh we're so honored that you're listening to our podcast and being inspired by it that's incredible that she was even able to uh share the pattern like that too yeah. i know that's really something something people Hang on to, and you know who crochets? My friend Caitlin crochets. <gasps> Do you think I Caitlin can make you one of these fabulous blankets? Caitlin, please make me one. Yeah, Caitlin, I, mean, how much? I think she could do it. <laughs> she, made me, she made me that big ass fucking duster. That's right. Have you? Oh, oh yeah. Well, it's, I mean, it's summer. You don't need that right now. But I wonder if she can make me a duster with the house on the back. <laughs> That's innovative. Yeah. I like that. I like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. Yeah, what else we got? We have a Apple podcast review. So just a big shout out to the review crew. And this came in from Songstress Guitar Girl. It's, and I think it's with a guitar, like oh, Songstress W Guitar Girl. Songstress W Guitar Girl. And she says, as a practical magic nerd, I'm loving this incredibly comprehensive dive into the universe. Keep it up, ladies, and thanks for being here. No, thank you for being here. Thank you, Songstress. <laughs> We love a girl with a guitar. Yeah. 
Yeah. yeah I, and uh, if you have an Instagram handle, reach out to us and let us know who you are. Because it's kind of hard to tell like who's leaving these reviews on Apple Podcasts and kind of figuring out if there are also our followers on Instagram. So we'd love to reach out and say hey, and we'd love to hear your music. Yeah, yeah. So Songstress, if you are on Instagram, we couldn't find you under that handle. So just uh, say, hey, that was me. And we really appreciate you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we do have some event news on the Practical Magic front. So the Enchanted Beetle on Instagram posted today that, that they are having a fall vendor market October 7th from 10 to 4 and that you can come in costume and it's in honor of Practical Magic's 25th anniversary and it's being held in Coopville, Washington. That sounds so much fun and I'm so bummed I that we can't go there. I know. I want to go. I know. Uh, next year. Next yeah. year, we got to figure this out. We're going to coordinate because is this the same person who has told us before they're trying, they were trying to do more Practical Magic anniversary things? Possibly. It might have been somebody else with Coopville in the title of their okay. handle. Yeah, um, we would love to. We'll we be, really would. Yeah. But we'll be in Salem this year for uh, yeah. October. But speaking of of Massachusetts, we also have some news from the Wayside Inn in Sudbury. And they posted today also as well. I guess like everybody's getting their fall event information out as soon as possible. And at the time of recording this, this is we're right now in, on August 8th. So Lionsgate. Lionsgate. Yeah, we're, at, we're celebrating the Lionsgate today. So by the time you're hearing this, the news will probably be, be a little older already. But just mark these events in your calendar if you're going to be in Coopville or you're going to be in mm -hmm. Sudbury. We want you to hit up all these cool little haunted events um so this one this the wayside inn posted have some spirited fun with the wayside inn foundation at our 2023 jerusha's halloween ball fundraiser what's up jerusha what's up jerusha? <laughs> what up jerusha a costume party with generous appetizers and beverages dancing music by dj t-rex and a wine and whiskey pole that sounds oh. Awesome. Popular last year tarot card readings and whiskey tastings will make a return. Last year's attendees set the costume creativity bar high, so we will once again hold a costume contest with prizes for the most creative, most historic, and most legendary. So bring your best. If costumes aren't your thing, not to worry. We just want to see you there. I can't so wait to see pictures of that. I know, and I'm bummed we're missing that too, because like our dates that are that will be up in that area are kind of like just missing all these cool events. Oh. But if you listen to our Sudbury episode, you would have heard us tell the haunting account of the Wayside Inn's resident ghost Jerusha Howe. And if you haven't already, go listen to that. And there's also a fun visual edit up on our Patreon for our eight dollar tier members of me telling the ghost story to Christina while. She cozies on up with her little 1600s era candlestick, and it's just such a fun clip. <laughs> so go watch that. It's it's awesome. You don't want to do back-to-back. -back, um, you don't want to go October 7th to the Washington, Coopville, Washington, and then try to get to Salem the next I would week. freaking love to. If we have it, okay, once we become jet-setting rock star podcasters and we have the budget to jet-set like that, for sure. We're there. But, but right now, we're, we're, we got... We got a little tight budget so we gotta work within those <laughs> confines but yeah we're nobodies people but we really things. really appreciate your support we love our patrons we love all the reviews thank you for telling all of your friends about us and getting us up over 800 followers on instagram mm -hmm. like we're not in it for the followers we just want everybody to tell all of their friends about this new practical magic content we're trying to share as well as our music and just keep that story alive in everyone's hearts in a new way yeah we're yeah. reinventing the wheel so to speak <laughs> yeah 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah more like a hoverboard <laughs> no, wheels needed. no wheel. futuristic wheels yeah yeah yeah, yeah. aka okay. lack lack of wheels lack yeah of the wheels. wheels are coming off just air <laughs> <laughs> All right, are we ready to dive in here? Are we going to talk about this? Uh, these paintings? Are we doing Salem Spiel right here? Oh, yeah, yeah. All right, so again, if you guys have been listening to us for the past few weeks, you will know that we will be in Salem October 11th through the 15th, and on that Friday, it's a Friday the 13th, we will be doing a Midnight Margaritas meetup. Have some Midnight Margaritas with the Stinas. We will be there. Uh, we do have a Eventbrite link that we will share in our show notes, and that's also in our Koji 
bio on our Instagram. Um, it's just a donation, little love donation. There's no real set price, but you could just go pop on over there and throw some uh, throw some cash our way because we need some we need some help getting up there. <laughs> oh no, we're we're we need we're help good. getting back home. That's the we help getting back get home. There. We yeah. might be stranded in Salem, but I'm fine with that. Hey, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. Yeah, when this comes out, we'll be about a month away yeah. from our trip. A month and a week or so. Mm -hmm. It's just coming so fast. So when we are recording this, until our Salem trip, there is tons of stuff that we have in store. We can't tell you just yet, but I can't wait to tell you. But please join us in Salem if you can. Again, if you can't make it to the event, totally okay. We'll be in Salem. Just find us on our Instagram and say, hey, I'm in town. Love to meet you. Yeah, or we, not. Be like, where are you? I'm trying to avoid you. We would love to meet anybody who listens to the show. We would just love to, you know, meet our listeners, see who's listening in. Mm -hmm. And also we have a uh, season one poster that Christina created in commemorance of our one year anniversary. That's also coming up at the end of October. Hello. And t-shirts, right? T-shirts for whoever comes to that event. I want to order my t-shirt now because I, I think we need to do like, like a little, little show commercials. And show <laughs> yeah, yeah. Show I do want to shout out my neighbor down the road when she gets to this episode andrea you're awesome she reached out to me the other day and she was like hey i'm really interested in this event you're holding i just started listening to your podcast and i love sandra bullock i don't think she's seen practical magic yet but i can't yeah. wait for her to watch and justina was like she's trying to get the down low on who you really are I'm like, <laughs> i am so unadulterated on here it's ridiculous but andrea what up yeah she just went to the neighborhood to find out if you're a serial killer She's just, she doesn't care about the podcast. She just wants to know who she's living next to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyway, yeah. are you ready to go? I'm ready to dive deep into to go. the depth. Go. All right, so we are talking about paintings today. More specifically, the portraits, kind of like the Renaissance era style, Baroque style, Romanticism style. Is that the name of the other one? I think Italianate might be thrown in there in the mix somewhere. If you guys yeah. missed our Victorians episode, go listen to that. But yeah, we're talking about the portraits and me and Christina do have a little bit of a background in painting, right? You took yes, painting courses. I've taken painting courses. I went to the Ducre School of Art in Plainfield, New Jersey, and it was a very small school, so it's very intimate. And I just like the painting classes there were my favorite. Our uh, instructor, his name was Michael Donato, and he was just the coolest Italian guy. He would just like let us listen to like weird music. He would just put on this like experimental like music stuff. It's such <laughs> I'm a cool like a, like interpretive dance kid in the corner. Totally, yeah, yeah. There might have been a person dancing in the background somewhere. I don't fucking know. It was lit it was l lit <laughs> it was a good time but i just wanted to mention that the style that i studied there this was a renaissance style we studied this technique called sfumato which we'll talk about a little a little later on but this is a renaissance era painting course that i did we would basically recreate the master's work so we will look through our textbooks find pieces that would inspire us that we would want to recreate and then basically what this technique kind of was was it was like an underpainting that created a smoky effect to create depth Depth. So we would do the whole canvas in like a burnt sienna, like a wash, and then we would go into it with the white highlights. And then once all the highlights were there, since the shades were already there, because that was the burnt sienna, you will go over that painting now in your colors with the oil. I didn't know it had a name because that's how I do my stuff. I didn't know it had a name. Yeah, um, but awesome. I think I think the sumato might, I don't know if it's the burnt sienna, but the technique he taught us was strictly burnt sienna underpainting. Mm -hmm white mm -hmm. highlights and then color over that that's and cool it just yeah it's like really cool like smoky dreamy yeah. kind of soft effect um i'll have to show you some of his work he he's also a children's book illustrator and i also when i was in that school i also took his children's book illustration courses oh yeah i'd love so, to yeah. see it he was just like a fascinating little italian guy <laughs> he was so much fun when you did the color would you have to put it on like really light almost like opaque like and do it like a lot of layers was that because i i don't know where i saw that if this is the same thing or not but like to make the warmth of that burnt sienna still stand out and give like the human like the blood underneath basically like they would put it in like really light mm -hmm. light layers yeah um, i don't and, like almost remember. watered down color i don't, and build I don't... it up think so i think it was more of like a dry brush type deal like we would okay. have the paint on our brush and then we put it onto our canvas and sometimes he would even have us if i remember correctly this was so freaking long ago this was like what 20 years ago at this point like take a rag and kind of like buff it out to kind of like soften it out i love it yeah um and then also he would teach us some kind of glazing techniques like once the 
colors were all there then you like glaze the whole thing and like it was really fascinating and like i just miss taking those painting classes i can't tell you i think the last time i actually used oil paints for anything was during those classes oh yeah i graduated to it I I don't really like oils. I think they're, they're messy. messy. They're just they. It's just oh, and they take forever to dry. Like yes. I hate. I'm so impatient. I'm like I want instant gratification. Like even when I use my watercolors, which you kind of have to wait for those to dry before you do the next layers too. I just stand there with my blow dryer. Me too. I do too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that was just a little bit about uh, that class. I do have all the masters that I recreated during my time in those classes. I think I scanned maybe all of the ones that I did there, but I will be happy to post those on the Patreon for anybody who wants to see my old art school. I do. <laughs> I would love to. Yeah. Uh, just seeing your, uh, was it for Skyclad? Yeah. Our, our Skyclad episode, you posted some over on our Patreon. Yeah. And those are in our after hours, I think, under yeah. the $3 tier. Is that right? Yeah. Yep. Any um, any uh, photos or any additional like you know just stuff we're talking about like this, anything like that we'll post on the after hours under the three dollar tier over on the Patreon. Um, I think it was the charcoal drawings for the Skyclad mm -hmm. episode. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's awesome. They were beautiful. Thank you. And then um for these paintings, I did Adam and Eve. I did like a replica of one of the Adam and Eve paintings. I did a portrait of a girl. I don't remember what the portrait was. And then I did, I did, a, I did a bunch. I did Mona Lisa's hands. Mm -hmm. Like, I think one of the projects when I was there, we had to zoom in or take like a master's works. So I picked the Mona Lisa. And instead of recreating the whole painting, you just hone in on like one section of the painting. So I wanted to, to like get better at drawing or painting hands in general and just kind of like the shadow. Hands are the hardest thing to paint or draw. Yeah. So I kind of just wanted to get better at that. So I've honed in on the hands. And and I just did a Renaissance style painting with the whole underpainting type deal with just the Mona Lisa's hands. And now it's hanging up in my parents, their living room. And my dad, he took like door framing and he made like a custom frame around it. That's so it awesome. Was, like, to go along with the David statue. You guys are so Italian. Sicilian. Sorry. I know. I know we are so Sicilian. But, but like it looks like it belongs in a museum. He made it look nicer than it than it. <laughs> Is, but there's something about a custom frame it was made with love he's so proud of you <laughs> I know. that's awesome yeah, yeah yeah so what about you tell us about your experience with painting. well i wanted to ask you was this right out of high school did you go right into the school right out of high school i did one semester at a community college i wasn't really thrilled like i took one painting course in my one semester there and i wasn't really thrilled with I guess, I don't know, the professor or like the projects were just- They're on a community college budget, which they're I feel so that. Like the teachers so, are, they're trying. It was so boring. It was so boring. But I have to say, we did go on a lot of class trips in the, like the one semester I was there. Like we went to New York. Oh my God. Like, we well, you're on, right like, there. Yeah. And it was like post fresh 9-11, like, like post 9-11, like probably like October, November. Like it was really soon after 9-11, we went into the city to like go to the museums in Chelsea. And it was like, it was- very very strange. It just felt yeah. like a ghost town, you know? Yeah, I'm sure. So you took a semester at the community college yeah. and you weren't feeling it. And then yeah. you found this school, which we talked about a little bit in that Victorian architecture because it has, it's a, such a beautiful building. Yes, it's, um, and you said it's Ducre. Yeah. So. It kind of reminded me of like, like a mini little Hogwarts and it, it's just got so much character. The front of the building is like old Victorian kind of style but then they had an annex on the back like they built a fresh kind of building off the back to expand the classrooms and stuff like that how long were you there so when you we're gonna get to the topic guys eventually i'm just curious like yeah. how long were you there because i don't remember going on trips that's awesome so you not only did the classical style portraiture but you were also taken outdoors yeah right to do outdoor stuff and did this teacher still want you to keep in the renaissance era painting style during that class yeah not just portraiture but other stuff you were doing or was it just like use this technique and tailor it to whatever you're painting no it was just like i guess to learn the techniques of the renaissance painters that's what the class was that's what the focus was it mm. wasn't necessarily to be like uh you need to use this in all the painting that you're doing okay right now i was just interested in the renaissance technique and i just wanted to learn it more and i heard good things about his teaching and i just you know wanted to explore what he had to teach to us and i i loved that class even though i don't necessarily still use oils i'm not going down that avenue with my art anymore but it was just a great experience and I loved all the stuff that I learned in that class, whether I use it today or not, you know? I wonder if you could apply it to acrylic. Oh, I'm no sure. Way. Yeah, 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 I'm sure. Like if you did an underpainting, um, you just have to work a lot faster because like, you know, you don't have that grace period with the oils not drying. I hate that. <laughs> oh, it's so rough. Yeah, I yeah, that. I know. Yeah. 
sucks. I had gone to a vocational school. We talked in older episodes about how this vocational school worked, but there were shop classes of all different sorts and kinds, masonry, carpentry, all that stuff. But they had an advertising art and design where I really kind of got my foot in the door with like learning how to Photoshop and all that stuff. And that's where we worked mostly ac acrylic. We didn't do any oil. I don't even remember if we did watercolor. Right. The teacher, it was his first year teaching. Love oh, him. I he was a great teacher, but I didn't really have like a direction. I just knew this is kind of all I have a strength in doing. Okay. So I might as well keep going in that direction. Yeah. So I went through high school and it was fine. I didn't really bring any of those techniques. I didn't learn techniques until I was in college. And even then, I don't remember anything. So I'm probably going to learn more today than I retained through art history in college. Yeah. Um, but I too went to a community college. And for the Associates in Fine Arts degree, they have you do paintings. I don't think we did watercolor. I think we did mostly oil, but they have you do drawing, 2D, 3D art, sculpture, painting photography like digital art i had to go through a world music class oh wow etc etc the awesome. world music thing was really cool but... how did that pertain to art did they make it connect somehow or was it just its separate own thing um so you had a choice like i could do pottery or i could do glass blowing you know what i mean it had yeah. to be you know in two years i knew i wasn't going to go to a four-year college yeah. doing two years was fucking plenty do i need world music knowledge yeah. no do i appreciate world music now more than i did then absolutely yeah. especially doing this and doing our WMSR stuff and learning about stuff I wouldn't normally listen to. Right. But through college, I was not a good student. The day I realized <laughs> I could skip class and nobody cared, uh -huh. oh my God, that was yeah. like life changing. Oh like, yeah, it was the same type of deal with me. I wasn't the best. I actually had to take an extra, okay, so my art school was only supposed to be a three-year school, but I ended up having to go the full four years because I failed my anatomy class. <laughs> Oh my god. I was so lazy. I was like, I don't want to draw skeletons. This is not <laughs> why I went to art school. But like, you know, that stuff is important because that contributes to your usage of like shading and making a figure oh, of the drawing. planes and the yeah. shadow and like what bone is going to exactly. be protruding here. Exactly. Totally. So like it totally contributes to, you know, your success in the life drawing classes. No so idea if I took a biology oh, yeah. anatomy class. I don't have a good memory. <laughs> no, me either. Me either. Yeah. Identifying body parts. The project that we had to do. We had to draw a skull. We had like a layer of tracing paper on top of that. I guess it was like muscle or tendon or whatever. And then you had like an extra layer of vellum over that. Oh. You had to paint in, I guess, the muscles and stuff. And it was just like so tedious. And I was like, I don't like this class. I like and that. actually ended up failing it. That's why I had to take a whole other <laughs> just so I could pass that class because it was a requirement to, you know, yeah. get my credits or whatever. But that was supposed to be a three-year school I do I don't even have a degree it was not an accredited school so I would have had to have taken my credits somewhere else to finish out with a degree so it's bullshit yeah at that you point I have a degree in my mind <laughs> at that point I was like I don't want to continue school I've already done my four years why do I need to keep yeah. going no I don't remember any of the techniques that were taught at all I remember specifically my art history class because we had to memorize I think it was about 40 or more popular pieces we had to memorize the name the year and the artist and what medium it was in oh my God. And the like memorization technique that my friend and I had used, like we were cramming because I think it was like pass fail. Like it maybe it maybe it was like yeah, if you got three to four wrong, then you were like. So the trauma of that is the only thing I really remember, which mm -hmm. fucking sucks. Because I'm sure if I did it over again, I would love it. But yeah. also, I don't like being told how to draw. You know. So <laughs> yeah. I was also called a copy machine. Did I uh -huh. tell you that? What? My, my professor was like, "You're not gonna get it," because I work from image and like or like a, a live model. And she was like, "You're not gonna get anywhere being a copy machine." <gasps> Well, fuck you. What a <laughs> batch. I know. So uh -huh. anyway, I've, I've always loved art. My mom says like the earliest memory of me doing any art was like she walked in. I was sitting on my little brother's chest with a Sharpie marker. <gasps> and I was like drawing all over him, giving him little tattoos and stuff oh when we God. were like four or five, something like that. That's funny. And uh, But I couldn't tell you anything I learned. I, I know there are a few artists that I really love and I wish I could capture what they capture. And I always strive. And one of them is William Turner or mm -hmm. Joseph Mallard William Turner um, but he's known as William Turner and he's an English romantic painter you might know him he does these huge like epically biblical shipwrecks and like Whoa. the storms and the seas I think you'd really like his lighting okay hold up connection Pirates know. of the Caribbean Will Turner I know <laughs> what the fuck uh -huh. awesome I think they actually used him in a Harry Potter movie yeah. I don't know 
I googled him and he came up as an, one of the actors in Harry Potter also played him. Okay. But um, John Waterhouse is another awesome painter. He uses the um, pre raphaelite Brotherhood style, apparently. <laughs> I'm reading from notes, guys. Yeah. Trust me. I don't know anything about art. I'm the wrong person to be talking about this. But his paintings are known for these depictions of women from both ancient Greek mythology and Arthurian legend. And his popular one, at least among witches, is that magical circle. Oh, I love painting. that painting. I know. He does such brilliant work. Beautiful. And um, Monet, of course, who doesn't love an impressionist. I love Monet. Have you seen this uh, mini series called The Impressionists? I it's don't a three hour mini series. I think it's on YouTube also. And it tells, oh, really? yeah, it has Richard Armitage. Richard Armitage. Did you watch The Hobbit? Ugh, I don't remember it. Okay, never mind. He yeah. plays one of the Hobbits. Okay. And he's very <laughs> handsome. <laughs> he plays Monet in this mini series, but it goes and it follows the history of um, the impressionist artists at the time. So Monet, Degas, Renoir, Cezanne, and Manet. Mm -hmm. And this is the little description they had on the IMDb, but it says entirely based on documentary evidence. Special effects transport the viewer inside some of the world's best loved paintings. The Impressionists will recreate the illuminated landscapes, haunting portraits and of the late 19th century France. Oh, that sounds awesome. I love it, that. It's really, really beautifully shot. It's very sad. Um, and it's really cool how these five very popular men are connected. Wow. It's very, very cool. I was, I went down like a little bit of like a, I went back to kind of my art background a couple months ago. There's an app that's connected with Pinterest, the Shuffles app. Remember the Shuffles app mm -hmm. we were like talking about? I was messing around with just like master's paintings and like the different masters. And I did like a little collage based on each one. So I'll pop those on over on the Patreon if you guys want cool. want to see those. Uh, Cause I was having fun making collages based on all my favorite painters. Share them, yeah. Also, I wanted to tell you, so there's this, uh, mu it's not really a music museum it's called grounds for sculpture in new jersey and it's basically kind of like an art park they also have a little restaurant in the front called rats and it's based on wind in the willows it's adorable and in the back there's like a little seating area outside where you can eat on the little terrace and you're overlooking a pond and there's a huge sculpture of a head in the water with like mist around it and then behind that is a bridge that I think it was based off of one of Monet's paintings mm -hmm. and it just looks so pretty. And the whole park, like it's just sculptures and things that are recreations of like the master's works. And it's just like such a cool day trip on a nice spring, cool day. It's just nice to stroll around and see all of the sculptures and all the artwork. And they have fountains and foliage and magical. it's really freaking magical. It's one of my favorite places to go. I would love to take you there because I think you would just love it. Awesome. The only other person I want to touch on is, I think he's our age. His name is uh, Gregorio Peppo. Yeah, and I found him on Twitch. He does live paintings, but check him out. Click okay. on his Insta. I'm going to link his Twitch, his Instagram, and his YouTube. This man is incredibly talented when it comes to using the classical style like Rembrandt, oh, yeah. like the Dutch Baroque artists. Mm -hmm. And you can watch him live on Twitch, sketching and drawing and using, showing you, talking you through these techniques. And his voice, I don't know where he's from. Yeah. He just has this really cute, subtle little accent of some kind. I would say Italian, but okay. he's probably an American guy. Super talented. I love his stuff. He's somebody I look up to that I could never do what he does, but I try. So, um, so Gregorio Peppo, what up, bro? Yeah, these are really cool. Like he's some Beetlejuice. Harrison Ford as Han Solo. He's got a uh, Mr. White from Breaking Bad on here. Really I love his style. I think it's almost Norman Rockwell esque. Yeah, I see it. it but mixed with like the classical it's i think it's stunning okay so before we get into i guess the whole painting spiels <laughs> Um, I just wanted to note some of the Renaissance painting techniques and not all of these paintings in the Practical Magic Owens residence are of the Renaissance style. Like some of them are Baroque. Is Does Baroque fall in, under the Renaissance seat? Like I don't even know that shit either. We're gonna find out. We're gonna find out. But um, I thought it'd just be cool to talk about some of these techniques. So the use of proportion is a big element in the Renaissance style. The first major treatment of the painting as a window into space appeared in the work of Giotto di Bodone at the beginning of the 14th century. True linear perspective was formalized later by Filippo, oh god, I gotta say this word, Brunelleschi, Brunelleschi, Brunelleschi. <laughs> I got I feel like I gotta say it like like I'm a dog. thing. Filippo Brunelleschi. Okay. <laughs> and Leon Battista Alberti. I say it like I'm like Dracula or something. <laughs> Alberti. Oh, 
Oh, oh. In addition to giving a more realistic presentation of art, it moved Renaissance painters into composing more paintings. Another element is foreshortening. The term foreshortening refers to the artistic effect of shortening lines in a drawing so as to create an illusion of depth. Then here's the term that I told you a little bit about before, the technique that I learned in my Renaissance painting class, sfumato, and that term was coined by Italian Renaissance artist Leonardo da Vinci and refers to a fine art painting technique of blurring or softening of sharp outlines by subtle and gradual blending of one tone into another through the use of thin glazes to give the illusion of depth or three-dimensionality. And this stems from the Italian word sfumare, meaning to evaporate or to fade out. And the Latin origin is sfumare, which is also means to smoke. So it's like kind of like a smoky kind of effect. And when I show you, yeah, when I show you like the paintings, what I'm talking about, you kind of see like, it's got like a really dreamy quality to it. Really neat. And he also used this, my instructor, he used this technique as well in his children's book illustrations which was oh oh, wow yeah a really cool twist i want to see that yeah Yeah. the portraits i did my maternal lineage i I use that technique so s f u m a t o yes i did not know what it was then there's another one called chiaroscuro which refers to the fine art painting modeling effect of using a strong contrast between light and dark to give the illusion of depth or three-dimensionality and this comes from the italian words meaning light i don't know if it's chiaro i think it's chiaro and dark scuro a technique which came into wide use in the baroque period there you go there you go yeah you were you were talking about the baroque period and there it is with that technique can you say that word again Chiaroscuro. Chiaroscuro. Okay. All right. I'm so glad you read that. You, we, whew, there's going to be a lot of Italian. It's going to be a lot of Dutch and French, I'm sure. <laughs> and German, right? Because Bruni the yeah. Elder, like that's, he's German. He's German. We're going to talk about it all. Okay, guys, if you did not attend art school, hang Here tight, because we are going to be talking about one portrait that does fall in the High Renaissance art period. And that was from 1490 to 1527 thereabouts. One of the other paintings we're going to talk about is from the 18th century styles, 1700 to 1799. And the 18th century was marked by at least three distinctive styles, the Baroque, the Rococo, and the Neoclassicism. And then finally, one that was influenced by French Neoclassicism, but was painted in the early 1800s. But more on that later, we are going to get into the art that appears in our beloved books and movie. Yeah. It's weird that there's multiple books, only one movie. It confuses the uh, the system sometimes. <laughs> the system, like your brain? <laughs> My brain. <laughs> hey, Aquarius moon, baby. Yeah, the system. system. This human meat sack. Okay, so we're going to start with where portraits, I guess, come up in all of our books. We'll start there as we normally do. And we're going to go chronologically because really there's only one biggie, right, that we talk about. I think so, yeah. Let's start with Magic Lessons. This is 1693. The passage is on page 340. And it says, when she, talking about Maria, arrived, the family's lavish mansion appeared to be a house in mourning with the damask curtains drawn and the candles and lanterns snuffed out. Maria was led upstairs by a servant, then asked to wait in a dim hall. Dutch paintings lined the wood-paneled walls and hand-knotted French carpets could be found on every floor. I wanted to add this one because this gives me all the visual feels that the Owens house has in the movies. They have those the masks. We're going to talk about the Dutch paintings on the dark wood panel walls that are coming down their stairs. Yeah. The, the mask, everything. So that's why I put that one in there. So was this when she was in the islands? I don't remember what this was. For. I think this is when she was going to help cure that young girl. Cause oh. this is later in the book. It's page 340. Got it. Okay. All right. And then another one that falls on 385, and this is 1696, three years later, says, When a traveling portrait painter came through town, he was hired to capture Maria's likeness in oils, rendering her image perfectly down to the bump she had on her hand from the day she pounded on John Hathorne's door. When sitting for the painter, she wore her favorite blue dress, with her dark hair caught up in a blue ribbon and the sapphire that she never took off fastened around her throat. She wore her new red boots, one Samuel Diaz had had fashioned in Boston, which she wore every day. It was said that her eyes followed you when you passed by her portrait and that she could see what was inside you and that you would know in that moment whether or not you had been true to yourself. That's eerie. I love that. I, I love that. Real quick. I don't know if you can see that one in the top. Oh, yeah. it's blurry. That one. Yep. That one's eyes will follow you. Who, who, who don't like that one? Who is that so nice. in your family tree? Who is that? That is my great great grandmother. All right. 
Wait, grandmother, great grandmother, great great grandmother. Great great grandmother. Marie Louise. Marie Louise. Marie Louise. I just like love that trope, like the haunted house when a painting's eyes follow you. That's so creepy. Yeah. So creepy. I think there's a, a technique you can use to kind of like behind that paint, like to give it a little like luminescence, kind of. I want to do that. Yeah. I'll fuck it up. Is it the next episode we're going to talk about the Daguero type? Daguero type? Yes. Oh, yeah, right. oh. we're going to be talking about weird eyes in the next episode. So stick around for that. Awesome. Yeah. That right. was the origin of this one and only portrait that shows up in the Practical Magic story. And it's of Maria, the matriarchal ancestor that started it all. Right. And they never mentioned like a Maria's portrait in the movie. They never even mentioned the no. portrait or anything, right? Mm -hmm. So next we're going to skadooch on over to Rules of Magic. And this passage is on page 23. And this says, there were two staircases, one a chilly back stairs that twisted around like a puzzle, the other an elegant stairway fashioned of mahogany, which if you guys listen to our Victorian episode, we kind of talked a little bit about why there were two t staircases. One was for the residents and then one in the back of the house in the kitchen that was for the help usually, mm -hmm. right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, so to go on with the passage, it says they stopped to gaze up the carved staircase to where there was a window seat on the landing. Above it was a portrait of a beautiful dark hair haired woman wearing blue. That's your ancestor, Maria Owens, their aunt told them as she led them to the dining room. She's staring at us, Jet whispered to her brother. This is Rules of Magic. So that's when Jet and uh, Francis and Vincent came to Aunt Isabel when she was on Magnolia Street, right? That's right. Yep. So Isabel had her hanging up. Yeah. Yeah. I'm wondering like who was in that house before Isabel, like, because we know that house spanned generations, right? Right. Right, yeah. right, right. There's so much missing passages of time. I want to know everything. Alice, write more books. <laughs> <laughs> or me and Christina are going to be forced to uh, make more. Make it up. <laughs> make more crappy fan fiction. <laughs> Which we almost did. I almost had a fan fiction in this one because we were like, oh, we're kind of grasping at straws here. But mm -hmm. I am curious. Yes. The portrait we're going to talk about later, how it ended up in their house. But we'll, we'll yeah. get there. Yeah. Okay. All right. So pages 34 through 35. Don't you think I look like her? Jet asked one day when she found Franny sitting pensively on the window seat studying the portrait. One of Maria's remedies called for the beating heart of a dove to be taken from the bird while it was alive. Another included collecting the hair and fingernail clippings of a disloyal man and burning them with cedar and sage. You don't want to look like her. Franny was quick to respond. She ended unhappily. Trust me, she was miserable. Which, hold on a second, hold the she phone. She doesn't know that. How, how does she know that, number one? Number two, at the end of Magic Lessons, I'm pretty sure Alice wrote that Maria had a full life. She had grandbabies. She lived happily ever after with Samuel Diaz. Like, she rode off into the sunset. It didn't seem like she had a miserable end of her life. So, plot hole. Franny is also a teenager. <laughs> and she's angst in her bones. And Franny's also a cynic. We know this. Even yes. in her older age, she was a little more of a cynic right yep um but i just thought that little plot hole just stuck out uh -huh. at me i don't know uh -huh. so she yeah so franny says she ended unhappily trust me she was miserable she was accused of witchery jet sat beside her sister i wonder if that would have happened to me if i was alive at that time i can hear what people are thinking you cannot franny said and then after a look at her sister she says can you <laughs> <laughs> And we know she can. Go listen to our Jet episode, yes, episode yes. 41. Yep, yep. All right, yep. so page 255. They wrap the portrait of Maria Owens in brown paper and string for storage, then put bay leaves and cloves in the closets to keep moths away. Right, because canvas, right? That's fabric. So moths will eat right through that shit. Yeah, you're right. Uh, they telephoned Charlie Merrill, who could be trusted to keep their business private, and had him exterminate the attic and the rafters to rid the house of beetles. Before he left, they asked him to fashion a plain pine coffin and to please do so quickly. He stood there, blinking, choked up, and not knowing quite what to say to Miss Owens. Wait a minute, so that's when, is that when Jet passed away? This is when Isabel, I think, is going to pass Isabel away. Isabel passed away. So... Yeah. Why did they pack away that portrait, you think? I don't know. Right? Why Maybe because they... they were going to close up the house. They weren't going to live there after she died. Remember, they, they went back. They lived somewhere oh, else. Yeah, they they lived somewhere else until... I don't remember if, if Vincent's whole spiel was before or after Isabel passed away. Like when he left and went to Essex. Do you remember? I don't remember. Okay. All right. Just another rabbit hole. I was like, hmm. Interesting. Okay, so page 353. Their world was mossy and green, with rain that splattered down for days on end. 
The girl's father, Daniel, was a fisherman and a guide on the Russian River. Their mother was a painter whose subject matter was trees, not surprising given their location. I just thought this was interesting because I wonder if they had any kind of relation to Bartholomew Brune or any of the painters that were featured or showcased in their house. It just seems like they have painter blood. They have painter in their blood. Like they, Regina was a painter. Who knew? I didn't remember that, that detail until I- I didn't remember either research this i also wanted to dive back into the titanic connection titanic okay because our theory that rose if you guys have been listening for a while to us you would know that we have a theory that rose was a long lost owens woman okay this article is from a book in bed.wordpress.com but if you've seen titanic a million times you would know this scene. you would re- remember this scene so in the movie rose played by kate winslet she has an extensive art collection including paintings by impressionist and modern masters edward degas pablo picasso claude monet before they were even famous right mm-hmm. and rose and her lover jack played by leonardo dicaprio who's also an artist. And I guess that's like why Rose felt so drawn to him because she saw his drawings and she just had that natural connection to the art world. Didn't she say like, was like looking into the eyes of somebody's soul or something like that? I don't remember the exact quote, but she like compared it to something of the sort. She's mentioned it being connected to like spiritual realms or other realms. I don't remember the exact quote. Don't quote me on that. We got to get on our Marco Polo group with Caitlin and talk about this. We have a Titanic. I know, I know. So Jack is an artist. I guess that's why she's so drawn to him. And they're both particularly enamored with her water lilies painting by Monet for his use of the color and the light. And then also in that one of those scenes, there's, I don't know how you say this word, Le Trois by Degas from 1878 and Les Demoiselles de Avignon by Picasso from 1907. And uh, the scene in which Rose displays her artwork is meant to communicate Rose's strength of character and depth of feeling for she is purported to support these artists. Although, according to her fiance, Cal, played by our boy Billy Zane, Picasso, he says, will not amount to a thing, right? Little does he know. Mm -hmm. The author of this blog post also goes on to say, no doubt Cal means to include Degas and Monet in his offhanded dismissal of what we know today to be three of the most influential and loved artists of the late 19th and early 20th century. And little does Cal know that Monet, Degas, and Picasso stars would rise to astronomical heights throughout the course of the 20th century. In fact, Degas was already a well-respected artist prior to his death in 1917, as was Monet, who would pass away in 1926. Picasso will live until the 1970s, but was already well established as a dynamic and experimental artist. So her connection alone to just like all these masters and like up and coming artists and like kind of like an R day finding like the new cool indie band that nobody's ever heard of yet. Like that's kind of like how Rose was with these paintings. And she was like such a collector. She was. So maybe the arbiter of taste. An arbiter of taste. Yes. Yes. Also, I have something else to add to this. I'm ready. You're gonna, you're gonna flip your fucking lid. Okay. Okay. How did how did we never see this before? Okay. Maria's painting. What was she wearing in that painting? Blue dress. What else? Sapphire. <gasps> the sapphire! What? The heart of the ocean, bitch! Oh my mind. Right? Okay. I'm there. Right? I'm there. Okay. Okay. Oh. You picking up what I'm putting down? Does the sapphire come around in any of the newer books? I don't know. We, we'll, we'll have to deep dive on that. If it doesn't, I'm convinced. It's connected. It's all fucking connected. Did this, you see my face? She's got to be a long lost Oh, and she's got the fucking sapphire. Oh. And then how does it, how does it get to, I guess, America? Titanic. Well, I mean, in Maria's day, oh. Maria, Maria came before Titanic, ship. but it had to have kind of crossed paths somewhere along the line. I don't know. I'm sensing another fan fiction bubbling up. <laughs> about this whole satellite. I like that connection. That is pretty amazing. Yeah. Yeah, I have some other stuff too about the whole Titanic crossover with Practical Magic, but I'm going to put that in my back pocket for another day cuz that's a whole other episode. Oh my god. Yeah, we're going to we're going to deep dive down that hole eventually. Sorry guys, you had no idea. <laughs> episode 1. You're in for it. Here comes Billy. You're in for it. All right. Anyway, where are we at here? We're uh I think we're getting into the Practical Magic book. 
Okay. So on page five, it says Jillian's favorite thing in the world to do was to lie on the velvet cushion window seat up on the landing where the drapes were made of damask and a portrait of Maria Owens, who had built the house so long ago, collected dust in the corner. I remember reading this book and like hearing about all the portraits and stuff. That's another reason why I did my maternal lineage. I was like, when I do buy a house, I was really, trust me, I had my eye on Victorian houses. And when we bought this house, it's not, I thought I'd have a staircase. I'd ha I thought I'd be able to like put all these cool old portraits yeah. on these stairs and have them be like guardians you know yeah. watching over me but it didn't happen but now they're in your studio watching over you yes yes page 14 it says on those murky evenings the sisters never protested that it was too early or that they weren't yet tired they tiptoed up the stairs holding hands from the landing beneath the dusty old portrait of maria owens the girls called out their good nights they went to their rooms slipped their nightgowns over their heads and then went directly to the back stairs so they could creep down again press their ears against the door and listen to every word and that's when they're little littles and they're mm -hmm. they're sneaking a listen about what the aunts are doing in yeah. their uh, their magical workings and maria owens is just watching them creep around she's just watching them giving them a little stink <laughs> eye from the staircase or the wall didn't list what page this was on so excuse me for that but this next entry says in the small portrait the aunts have sent kylie for her birthday which arrives in packing crates two weeks late Maria is wearing her favorite blue dress and her dark hair is pulled back with a blue satin ribbon. This oil painting hung on the staircase of the Owens house for 192 years. All right, Justina, go do the math. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I'm not doing the math, but I'm just thinking, okay, so this happens after Rules of Magic. So they took the painting of Maria out of storage to send to Kylie because in Rules of Magic, they put it into storage after Isabel died. So that painting was sitting in storage until Kylie's birthday. Wow. Yeah. Well... Did they put it because when the when Sally and Jillian were younger, like we just read, it was did I miss you saying that it was it was hanging up in on the landing? All right, so there's a plot hole. So they put it back up at some point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if this is 1998, yeah. we're saying Practical Magic's 1998. Yeah, 192 years from then is 1806. Mm-hmm. Wait, what about 1806? Hold on, where are we at? It says the Owens house. It hung in the Owens house for 192 years. Okay, so 1800s, yeah. So the early start of the Industrial Revolution, right? Mm -hmm. When when did the Titanic come over? 1913. All right, so the painting was hung up prior to the Titanic sinking. Yeah. So it couldn't have been Rose. Okay, the math does not work there. <laughs> yeah, that's if this is 1998. But okay. anyway, right. it says, In the darkest corner of the landing beside the damask drapes, Jillian and Sally passed by it a thousand times on their way up to bed without giving it a second look. Antonia and Kylie played games of Parcheesi on the landing during their August vacations and never even noticed that there was anything on the wall other than spider webs and dust. They mm -hmm. notice now Maria Owens is hanging above Kylie's bed. She is so alive on the canvas, it's obvious that the painter was in love with her by the time he had finished this portrait. When the hour is late and the night is very quiet, it's almost possible to see her breathing in and out. If a ghost were to consider climbing in the window or seeping through the plaster, he might think twice about facing Maria. You can tell just by looking at her that she never backed down or valued anyone's opinion above her own. She always believed that experience was not simply the best teacher, it was the the only one, which is why she insisted the painter include the bump on her right hand where it had never quite healed. I like how she carried that over from magic lessons like I know. where she like banged on John Hathorne's door or whatever. I love that. And yeah. Little Easter egg. Uh, the day I told you I painted that, right? What? I painted the scene like in my mind of Maria running across the field to the town at night. Did I show you that painting? No. So if I can find it, I'll show you. But it's kind of almost uh, not impressionist. Like what's the other word? Like surreal. And it was okay. hanging up in our California house for a long time. And everybody who came in saw something different. Really? It was weird because it doesn't, it really doesn't look like what it's supposed to look like. But I loved hearing all the stuff that they thought it was. I want to see So I'll it. show it to you and I'll put it on our Patreon. Okay. Don't right. forget. Cool. Cool. The day the painting arrived, Jillian came home from work smelling of french fries and sugar. Since Sally had chopped down the lilacs, every day was better than the one before. 
The sky was bluer, the butter set out on the table was sweeter, and it was possible to sleep through the night without nightmares or fears of the dark. Jillian sang while she wiped off the counters at the hamburger shack. She whistled on her way to the post office or the bank, but when she went upstairs and opened the door to Kylie's bedroom to find herself face to face with Maria, she let out a screech that frightened all the sparrows in the neighbor's yard and set the dogs howling. Oh my god. What a dreadful surprise, she, she said You to know Kylie. why? Because she feels judged. She feels mm. so guilty for what See, they- She's seen, right? Yeah. She has seen you. Exactly. What a dreadful surprise, she said to Kylie. Jillian went as close to Maria Owens as she dared. She had the urge to drape a towel over the portrait or to replace it with something cheery and ordinary, a bright-toned painting of puppies playing tug-of-war, children at tea parties setting out cakes for their teddy bears. Who needed the past right there on the wall? Who needed anything that had once been in their aunt's house up on the gloomy landing beside the thre 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 <laughs> Hold on. Thre beside the threadbare drapes? This is way too creepy to have in the bedroom, Jillian informed her niece. We're taking it down. Maria's not creepy, Kylie said. Kylie's hair was growing out, leaving her with a small brown streak half an inch wide in the center of her head. She should have looked odd and unfinished. Instead, she was growing even more beautiful. In fact, she resembled Maria. Side by side, they might even appear to be twins. I like her, Kylie told her aunt. And since it was her bedroom, that was that. Jillian claimed she would be too nervous to sleep with Maria hanging above them. She'd have nightmares and perhaps even the shakes. But that's not the way it's turned out. She stopped thinking about Jimmy completely and no longer worried that someone will come along looking for him. If he owed money or had cut a bad deal, the men who'd been wronged would have been there by now. They would have come and taken what they wanted and already be gone. Now that the portrait of Maria is on the wall, Jillian had been sleeping even more deeply. Each morning, she wakes with a smile on her face. She's not as frightened of the backyard as she used to be. Although every now and then, she drags Kylie to the window just to make certain Jimmy hasn't come back. Kylie always insists she has nothing to worry about. The garden is clear and green. The lilacs have been cut so close to the roots, it may be years before they sprout again. Once in a while, something casts a shadow across the lawn. God damn, my mush mouth. Once in a while, something casts a shadow across the lawn, but it's probably the toad who has taken up residence in the roots of the lilacs. They'd know if it was Jimmy, wouldn't they? They'd feel more threatened and much more vulnerable. 148 to 150, that's where that fell. That's interesting that initially Jillian was like put off by the painting, but then like after coexisting with it at the wishes of Kylie, she felt more at ease and more protected and mm -hmm. more like there wasn't this loomingness hanging over her head anymore about the horrible things that she's done. <laughs> it's almost like there was something scarier that was on her side. You know what I mean? There was something looking out for her that was worse than, I don't think Jimmy would fuck with Maria. You know what I mean? Right. Right. Because now they're both in the spirit world at that point, you know? Yes, yes. I think they met up in the spirit world somewhere in purgatory or wherever they are and Maria sat Jimmy down and was like, listen here. Listen. Well, if she had we wouldn't have that whole exorcism problem but again there's no mention yeah. in the movie of maria's portrait that's right that we know of yeah we don't even know if it exists in the movie but there are tons of portraits yes. in the movie which we're going to talk about now is this oh no we have oh, we have one more book right okay all right so i checked book of magic this is the last book in the series i checked this for mentions of painter or painting there's like maybe one or two references but it's in reference to ian and like the dude in prison who like did all his tattoos yeah so i just like scratched i was like ah all right but then i searched portrait and this is what I found. So on page 44, it said, Jet would never know the end of Kylie's story. Her darling great niece, who had been such a charming, awkward child, who loved to work in the garden and get dirty, who borrowed Jet's novels and sprawled out on the window seat below Maria Owen's portrait to read while Sargasso C and Jane Eyre. Okay, hold up. Again, plot hole. So Kylie had Maria's painting for her birthday in Practical Magic, but now by Book of Magic, now it's back at the aunt's house on Magnolia Street? But when they were younger, so Kylie didn't get this portrait until her 13th birthday. Yes. And remember, they would go like vacation, like summer, go see the aunts during the summer mm -hmm. and stay there during the summer. So probably when Kylie and Sally and Antonia would go see their aunts for the summer, maybe that's when she was doing her reading on the landing. But this is when they're older. Book of Magic takes place now in today's day. So Practical Magic takes place in but the 90s, right? Right, so right, right. But Jet's just reminiscing. She had been such a charming, awkward child who mm -hmm. loved working in the garden. Okay. Working in the garden too, probably when she was younger. So that could have been, yeah, before Kylie turned 13 and inherited yeah. this portrait. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. That makes more sense. And she Whoa. inherits the house. Kylie? In, yeah, yeah, Kylie. Right. Yeah, you're right. 
She also inherits the house. Oh, right. my gracious. So, so in essence, that portrait could have very well made its way back onto that staircase once Kylie took over that house. You might have put that picture back up where it was. Amazing. Oh, cool. Yeah, we're just speculating. But that's so cool to, to think to think that would happen. Page 60. Sally looked for Franny, who was nowhere to be found. She came upstairs to check on her aunt, passing by Maria's portrait on the landing. No, there it is. That's today. So it is back on their landing in the book of magic hmm. but sally passed by it on the landing so it's back at the aunt's house yeah weird but kylie had it on her 13th birthday in the 90s but then it somehow made its way back to the aunt's house on magnolia street by the time jet passed away okay okay that is a little confusing hmm, maybe she had more than one portrait what hole what hole i don't know Okay, anyway, so page 63. He, talking about Raphael, Jet's love interest, stopped in the hall to observe the portrait of the Owens ancestor Maria on the stairwell, staring back at him with her clear gray eyes. Despite her gaze, which seemed to track his movements, he went upstairs when no one was looking. And yeah, that was after Jet's death, I believe. Very interesting so again it's the traveling portrait sisterhood of the traveling portrait pants exactly oh, no. portrait pants. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh do you know on teespring you can do full print leggings what if we did a portrait of <gasps> maria owens and printed them on full length leggings wait but which portrait of maria owens we which can one? make one remember that picture i sent of you i was like this looks like maria to me do you remember that probably you sent me tons of shit i don't I know, know. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. Anyway. All right. So that wraps up all the book mentions. We're going to deep dive into the movie now because this is a whole other rabbit hole. I'm so Shit. excited. Let's get into the movie. That's all I have. <laughs> <laughs> okay, guys, that's it. The episode's over. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to think how to how to explain how this mm -hmm. came to form itself. You know what I mean? Like right, there's right. we kind of ripped this massive band-aid off a dam and just every all this stuff new information came at us so yeah yeah, yeah. so jump in. there's tons and tons of portraits kind of pepper throughout this set in the film and unfortunately i tried looking for like a lot of these paintings like on google just typing in keywords like renaissance woman in yellow dress with yes. child or dress with white rose or like you know just keywords nothing i'm not wasn't finding anything on any of these paintings minus a few which we kind of identified thank mm -hmm. you thanks to david which yeah. we'll talk about in a second but a lot of them are unrecognizable so if you guys know what any of these paintings are called minus the ones that we already talk about today we would love mm -hmm. to have your input i couldn't find anything on like the set design the prop design anything that like the designers of the set like Stephen alice robin sandifer anything that they would have made public knowledge couldn't mm -hmm. find anything on a lot of these paintings so we're kind of just speculating on these today like kind of like what we think about them so this might have a part two it i might. even put some of these up on a uh a, a reddit like what painting is this so hopefully maybe somebody will figure it out on there right. but um we will have a bunch of photos in our show notes so check out our patreon for these show notes but if you've been through the movie and you know some of these paintings we have not touched on today please let us know so we can do a part two we would love to do a part two. Also, I do want to mention that today's episode is a visual episode. We do one visual episode a month. So check out the Patreon under our $8 audio visual tier and you will see the entire episode along with the, you know, what we're talking about. You get to see the photo stills of the photos that we're referring to when we're talking about them, just so you can like get a little context. It's a little nicer to get okay. some. Yeah. So that's all I want to mention. But shout out and big thank you to David Spellman Baker for helping us find some of these. Real quick about David. He was a special guest in our Sudbury episode number 39, and he showed us some work that he is doing of a replica of one of the portraits in the Owens house from the film where he's kind of like superimposing Nicole Kimmon and Sandra Block's face all into one painting that I think it was supposed to be the Maria's portrait, but I'm not sure. Christina, do you remember which one he was doing? I actually think one of the portraits was actually Nicole and Sandra's face put together because the artist was Sandra's brother-in-law. Right. Or that was I might story. get that mixed up. It, he took his wife's image, which is Sandra Bullock's sister, yeah. and kind of superimposed all three into one one face to yeah. different features. Okay. But that's what I remember. 
All right. So in our show notes, maybe we'll link because we have everything like the topic map. Maybe we'll just link the timestamp of when he's talking about his painting. So anybody listening to this, if you want to revert back to when David was actually talking about oh, yeah, yeah. The painting he was working on, you can listen to his own words because we're probably botching whatever, you know, he told us. <laughs> right. That was already how many episodes ago. So yeah, so go check that out. We'll We'll link that down below. All the stuff that he's creating, like all his replica art. Very cool. Cool stuff. An amazing. Amazing. amazing human so right? talented so talented not just the, the replica stuff but like the the sewing that he's doing the creating the costumes and stuff my god yeah it's amazing he's out of this world <laughs> so before we jump into these historical paintings that are actually featured in the movie i want to just talk about where we think maria's portrait would hang mm -hmm. because in the books it's in the stairwell there's tons of portraits hanging in this main stairwell. And I think we talked a little bit about this in the Owens House episode, but some other portraits we'll talk about, like I said, in the future, we were able to screen grab and Justina got really good still screen grabs and, and circled the portraits for us. So those will be available, but we're just gonna theorize like where we think Maria's portrait would hang. In my opinion is it should be front and center over the mantle in the living room. That's where I think it would be. And in the movie, this portrait is the first one there. In the movie, this portrait that hangs over the mantle, it's a woman in kind of Puritan clothing, holding a little baby in her lap with her hand to her chest. And I'm thinking it's this one. Some of the other portraits have the hands visible also, but if you're sitting for a portrait and like they said in the books, like her hand is visible. Mm -hmm. to show the the injury on her right hand question did she get this portrait done before or after faith was born i don't know i don't know hold on we have to go back in time and see like when was faith born faith was born march 20th let's see what year was that i don't think she would have been a baby no but maria had that second child with oh, that's right that's right she did but but she also sat for her painting way before the second child how do we know this because it happened earlier in the book and she had the child with samuel at the end of the book hmm. okay faith was born i'm trying to find the beginning of the chapter that has the like the time stamp oh 1679 so faith was born 1679 keep that number in mind okay when was she painted I don't think it said a year. 1696. Okay, so the faith wouldn't work out. Oh, uh, yeah, because she would have been uh, like older by that point. Yeah. So then, yeah, I don't know. So then that first picture over the mantle with the child, that couldn't be Maria if we're going by the books. I know. It's so tricky because... Right? Who knows what these portraits are? I know. Yeah, there's so but that's many. That's the whole fun of this podcast is that we just, we, it's just all speculation and it's fun to like make different theories and like it yeah. could be, it could not be. We don't know. Yeah. So the ones I was able to grab that were clear for me are not the same. Uh, some of them are the same, but Justina was able to grab way more. But there's one over the mantle. There's many on the main stairs. And then there's one on the back stairs. That's a pretty big canvas. You can see mm -hmm. when the girls are sneaking down to watch the aunts do their magic and when Midnight Margaritas is happening. So that's, mm -hmm. you can, can glimpse it. This picture that I put here, I clipped together three different yeah. shots to get, oh, to get oh, all you the did? little pieces. Oh my god, okay. I was like, why is that doesn't look like the exact clip that I pulled from the movie? Because there's a couple different shots of that painting in different scenes. Yes. Um, one is at kind of like at night with indoor lighting when Jet's coming down the stairs, so it's kind of darker to see. But then you can also see it a lot better in the morning daytime scene when Jillian and Sally get in that little argument and Jillian starts to go up the stairs and she stops ah. right in front of the painting. And when she comes nice. back down, you can see it a lot better because it's more well lit because that shot during the day. Awesome. I didn't even get that far. Cool. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Screen share and show me what you got. All right. So this is the very first shot that I was talking about where Jet's walking down the stairs and you see that little painting right behind her. And this is as Jet's coming down the staircase in the scene where Sally's kind of like rushing to answer the phone because Jillian's calling her in a tizzy. So that painting, I can't tell. It's like a woman holding a flower in like uh, yeah. a yellow dress. Mm -hmm. You can't really white tell. rose. She's holding a white rose. A white, there it is. A white rose. There it is. A white rose, because we talked all about the white roses in our rose episode. Go listen to that episode. I don't know if this is a Renaissance style 
it kind of looks like the Renaissance style that I was telling you how I painted in school. Um, it's kind of got those soft, the effect. This flashes very, very quickly. I went back probably like five or 10 times just to like pause it at the right time. Cause Jet kind of like zooms down those stairs. She's and by the, quick. And by the time the camera follows her down the stairs, like the picture's already gone. You can't really see much of it in this scene. Is Franny even in this scene? Because I didn't even note this in our Jet episode. She's the one who's like, it's Jillian. She's coming down the stairs. Like she's got the intuition. No. Where the hell's Franny? Franny shows up after Sally already comes down the stairs and is like, I'm taking the first flight out of Logan. And that's when Franny and Jet are standing next to each other. Like, right, right, right. But in this, when the phone is ringing. When the phone is ringing, Jet. that's right. Jet is the first one racing down those stairs. Like what's wrong? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love her. I love her even more. Yeah. So, so that painting, yeah, you see the painting for the first time in that scene. Okay. And then we'll call it Woman with a Rose. Woman with the White Rose. Yeah. By the way, the timestamp in that first one is about 29 minutes and 56 seconds into the movie. And also there might be little like painting shots before like a half hour into the movie, but I didn't think that there were any that were sticking out of my mind that I had to remember. All right, so then the next painting is uh, when Sally is writing the letter to Jillian and she's like kind of standing on the balcony looking at the moon. You can see a painting behind her in her bedroom, kind of like right behind her little desk where she's writing her letter. I can't really make out details, but it's just a portrait of a girl. It looks like it a does look like a younger, a younger girl model of some kind because the features like the shoulders are kind of soft and round. The head's a little bigger. It looks yeah. like a kid. Right. Yeah. So this one's a little fuzzy. Again, this film was not shot in HD in the 90s, right? So okay. it's a little fuzzy. Even if you blew it up, it would probably get even more fuzzy. So it's kind of hard to tell what that painting is. That is at 28 minutes and 50 seconds. And then the next one, here we go. Here's where all the paintings kind of like hit us all at once. Yeah. <laughs> this is 30 minutes and four seconds. This is a scene where Sally's rushing down the stairs to get the first flight out of Logan. Right behind Sally, we can see a painting of looks like a Puritan style woman. I can't tell what she has in her hand. Can you tell? It's either a scroll or a book. To me, she looks more like Tudor style. Tudor style? If you look at our notes, I kind of enhanced it Oop. a little bit. Oh, you can zoom in there. there but she go. has like a... Um, it doesn't look like a bonnet. It almost looks like one of those like head pieces, like the crowns. Okay. And th there's more frills. There's more puffiness than I think right. Puritan ladies would have worn. Right, but right. Nice. That's cool. You can zoom like that. Yeah, we don't know what who who painted this one, right? We don't know the painter or what no. this one's called. Okay, so that one's unidentifiable. So if you guys want to hit it up on the Patreon, go see what it is. If you know what it is, let us know. We will love any additional information about any of these. Um, and then there's also this one in the same frame on the left hand side. Do we think that one might be Maria? It could be. She looks very stern. Mm -hmm. No expression, no smile, no nothing. That could definitely be Maria. Could be. But there's no hands in it. So, but that's right. again the book. Right. But it is on the stair landing. Mm -hmm. Um, it doesn't really look like the actress that they use to portray Maria at all. So no. if we look at it from that perspective, then it might not be Maria. So then the next one, okay, so this one you can see the actual portrait, the one that was to the left in the frame, in the last frame. Now it's more center focus. You could see it a lot better. So yeah, she doesn't have any hands in the photo, but she's got kind of like a frilly lace. Is that like a scarf or something? Or is that just like the lapel of her whatever shirt she was wearing or blouse she had on? Yeah, very lacy neckline yeah but this is very dark like dark style mm -hmm. i don't know what style you would call this period but it doesn't look like renaissance to me i don't think it's renaissance could it be one of those dutch paintings that they were right. talking about I don't know. That one is at 30 minutes, five seconds. The next one that we have is 30 minutes, six seconds. And this kind of goes really quick. So I had to kind of like pause kind of fast. Next to when Sally comes down the staircase all the way, we see a little more in the frame on the left hand side next to the painting we were just talking about in the last frame. This one is a little bit of a smaller painting. And we do know the artist to this one. That one was Young Girl Asleep in a Chair by the artist Antonio. Antonio Rotari, an Italian painter. We'll deep dive on that painting a little later on. I just wanted to mention what that artist is at the timestamp so you can identify it. Um, but that's what that one is. And that's at 30 minutes, six seconds. Next, we have when Sally gets her coat on and she's ready to go out the door. This is at 30 minutes and 20 seconds. Here it is. This is the main spiel that we're talking about today, right? Princess Sybil of Cleves. We have a whole deep dive on the Cleve family a little later on. But like, I wonder why she had this in the house. Like, I wonder, is there 
there some kind of connection with the painter or the princess herself? Was there any relation? Like, I don't know. Makes me wonder. This scene makes me feel like rally the troops. You know what I mean? They flash all these women, all these ancestors. Hey. It basically makes me feel like, all right, girls, like let's clean house. Let go let's go get Jillian together. Yes. <gasps> Yeah, I never put that together before, but you're right. Before Sally's ready to go out the door, like in her coat of arms, ready to save Jillian, the ancestors are all there. Mm -hmm. they, are they all ancestors? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know if Princess Sybil of Cleve is an ancestor, but maybe all the <laughs> maybe all the people on the staircase are. Right. You We're know? not sure. We're gonna find out. We're not sure. Actually, do we ever find out if the people on the staircase are the relatives? We don't know. So then the next one, again. This is a kind of a better angle of the one on the staircase. When the girls are coming, Sally and Jillian are coming down the stairs for Midnight Margaritas, we get another flash of that Renaissance woman in the yellow dress with the white flower, the one that we saw earlier that Jet just kind of breezed by. We see it a little more here, but it's still kind of dark. So I thought it was worth mentioning because it flashes again in this scene. 40 minutes, six seconds, and we do see this, I think, one more time a little later on in the daytime so it's, you could see the details better. Next we have... All right, so now this is when Gary comes to the house to question Sally about the disappearance of Jimmy. And Antonia is going to answer the door. So in this shot, we see a couple different paintings from this angle. There's one behind, like if the door were to open, there's one to the right that would be behind the door. And I think that one is called, was it called Two Sisters or Three Sisters or something like that? I think it's called Two Sisters. Yeah, it's called The Sisters, Eleanor and Rosaba Peel. And that artist is Rembrandt Peel. So we'll deep dive on that a little bit later on as well. So then it closes up when Gary finally comes in the door. You can see a closer shot of that painting at about one hour, eight minutes and 17 seconds. And you could see the more detail of the two sisters depicted in that painting. Then when we go to the next shot, when Sally comes down the stairs to greet Gary and Antonia runs off, this one kind of like stuck out at me. It's like kind of like a cameo kind of picture. It looks mm -hmm. like it could be a portrait of somebody, maybe another ancestor. We don't know. This is very fuzzy and very dark lit. So it's kind of hard to tell what that is, but it's a little small oval canvas at like the very top. There's nothing above it. There's a, mm -hmm. I think there's a portrait underneath it, but we can't see it. Yeah. But there is a little oval canvas to the very far right of that shot mm -hmm. when she's standing at the top of the stairs. Yeah. Don't know if that's a master's work. It could just be like something somebody in the family painted or passed down to them. Who knows? Also, sorry, we're going to step back a little bit. I don't know what timestamp it is, but you can get a clear shot of that woman with the rose when Kylie is looking out to the garden and it flashing back to Sally and Jilly standing in the kitchen and oh. Andrew's kind of like leaned over looking for the medicine. Okay. And she's like, what, what man? And it flashes a couple times. So that's also okay. where I got some of my screenshots. Okay. All right. I yeah. I didn't even think to look in that scene, but the next scene that I kind of like remembered that we see a flash of it was in this scene mm -hmm. during the day after Jillian and Sally have that argument in the kitchen after the toad burps up the ring and Gary's like, what the fuck? And he leaves. Mm -hmm. So Jillian is standing on the staircase and you, it's daytime now. So you can kind of see the color palette a little better mm -hmm. because the white balance, it's well lit now. Like you can see the yellow in the dress. You can see kind of like reds and reverse image searching this thing like nothing Impossible. nothing comes up yeah um so I, I still don't know what that is but it's a huge painting it takes up that entire wall pretty much i love it right? it's beautiful if anybody knows what this painting is please tell us i want to know what oh the can you imagine having that in your house right also Whoa. i just want to ask do you think all of these paintings were sourced via like the renaissance like public domain theory? yeah like public domain or do you think any of these paintings were painted from scratch as a means to to put in the film right could be yeah are they well could be originals are they original paintings trying to pass them off as older renaissance era paintings that mm -hmm. could be a possibility too i would love to pick one of their brains like anybody in the set department who sourced all these would come love on guys i know somebody's gotta know somebody tell us something <laughs> All right, so then in the next slide, we have Sally coming in from that conversation with Gary under the roses about when he's like, oh, I wish for you too. When she comes back in the house right before Jillian is possessed by Jimmy and licks her face, right? We see her close the door behind her and we see a flash of the gold rim of the frame of uh, that Sybil Princess of Cleve portrait in this shot. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's what that is. Oh, yeah. you know, I never noticed. Is that a piano next to it? No. I think it's some kind of hutch. Okay. Because they have a piano in the other room, in the uh, living room. All right. Yeah, because a lot of older pianos have that thinner top piece, and then it divots, and then it mm -hmm. kind of extends yeah, out upright. that way. Yeah, like an old upright mahogany piano. In the house I lived in, L.A., we had an upright piano like this. Nice. It was old, and it was just like, it was really cool. So then the next slide. Ooh. I've never noticed this painting before. I've never noticed that either. So this is the scene. This is about an hour, 27 minutes, and 33 seconds. This is when Sally just knocks the shit out of Jillian because she senses <laughs> Jimmy after he licks her face. She knocks Jillian out. Kylie and Antonia come running like, Mommy, what happened? In that shot where Sally's just kind of like standing there with her fists, like about to like go to town again if yeah. Jillian got back up and tried to knock her out. Behind her, you can see a painting on the wall above that hutch. We, we don't see that in the previous shot, right? No. It's cut off. Yes, it is. It's cut off, so we don't see it there. And we also don't see it in the earlier shot of Gary when he's, because it's like flat against the other wall. And here we can see a clear shot of it. It's a portrait of a woman in kind of like a yellow top. And I can't tell if she's like holding a bird, like, hold it on. It looks like a grouse or something. Yeah, like a pheasant. Right. But it also kind of gives me like a Madonna feel, not the singer, like, yeah like mother mary but kind of oh. like how she's portrayed from the side sometimes but never seen her in yellow yeah and it's very dark so who knows if this is even a woman which right. we're going to speculate later like are there any male portraits in this whole house yes there is there is a male <gasps> portrait there's only one i found in the entire movie but we, there is one and it, have it. it flashes quick so like if you're not really looking out for it you miss it here it is it's the next one actually okay so we know that jillian's possessed by jimmy the aunts come home also so there is a shot of the aunts in front of this one in this um, scene as well yeah. before the coven comes over and kind of tries to like get Jimmy spirit out of Jillian once they finally do you know that scene where there's like that flash of light mm -hmm. look what I found on the wall once that flash happens who is that man a portrait of a dude who's that man I don't know I was trying to like I googled like pure oh, good luck portrait of a man or like colonial portrait of a man like they all look the fuck it looks like he's wearing a tux though he doesn't look it, like puritan to it, me i don't know i just searched that he looks like a black tie that does look like a black tie do you think that's more like i don't know 18 1900s i have no idea it's kind of hard again it's blurry we don't really see a clear shot of him it's and there's again, a man in the house that's crazy do you think i was gonna say do we think that's uh what's his face dr burke Owens. Oh, you think so? I don't know. Well, it couldn't what be if Vincent. That's poor Ethan. It couldn't be Vincent. Maybe it is poor Ethan. Very cool. Yeah. What does that look like at the eight o'clock from where your red circle is? Is that another portrait laying on the ground? Did it fall off the wall? It could have very yes it could okay hold on let me close up on that yeah because remember when like the wall is shaking you could see portraits falling off the wall when franny right. is standing there behind her the portraits are falling so that's really good continuity for the portrait to be on that floor that looks like a puritan lady that does look like a puritan lady she's got like a that the black cloak on the kind of like head covering the scarfy thing the white the white smock skirt. yeah that does look like a puritan lady that actually kind of looks like that lady remember that lady in the beginning that's like witch she yeah. like mouths the word witch <laughs> Yes. It kind of looks like that lady a little bit. How about that? Sneaky, sneaky yeah, portrait there. Sneaky. But great, great continuity. I didn't even notice that. Good catch, Christina. I always pictured... Oh, I guess that is that one. Wait a minute. What way am I looking here? Okay, that's there. That's there. I was always picturing... Because when the walls are flapping around and they're looking at Franny, right? I was picturing Franny diagonally from where that portrait is on the other side of the room. Shows how much I know. Could but be. that makes a lot of sense that it would be yeah. right there. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, yeah. So that was, I think that's the second to last one. And then the very, very last one is that one over the fireplace. So the, the wide angle of the dust on the ceiling falling to the floor when Jimmy's ghost, they, before they sweep up all the dust out of the house and all the women are looking up at the ceiling, you could see the fireplace with all the candles on it. And then right above that, the mantle centerpiece is that beautiful portrait of the woman with the baby at her breast. And that's one of the ones that we were kind of 
speculating earlier, like, is that Maria? Could that be Faith? Is that the second child Maria had? Who's in this picture? <laughs> Who is this? Yeah. And why are they of so much importance that they get the centerpiece above the mantle? This has mm -hmm. to be somebody in the family that had some kind of relevance to mm -hmm. their whole family tree or storyline. Mm -hmm. Maybe, could it? No, it can't be Isabel. This is way too old. <laughs> That's way too old to be. Uh... Well, if the aunts were dressing like Victorian ladies in the 90s, who's to say Aunt Isabel wasn't dressed like a rena renaissancearian person, a so, renaissancean? A renaissancean. <laughs> You're absolutely right. Yeah, that could very well be. Maybe that's their shtick. Yeah, so that was the last slide. Uh, and that is at an hour and 35 minutes and 55 seconds. The one of the dude before this one we were talking about was at an hour and 35 minutes and 35 seconds. That's amazing. So Very check, cool. Check those out. And we, yeah, again, we'll put these photos in our Patreon post so you guys can kind of see in context. And also, again, we're doing this episode visually, so you'll see a whole visual edit on the Patreon if you want to see all the slides in context with what we're talking about right now. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for putting those together. That's great to see them like that. It was fun to kind of like, you know. You're a little detective. Find micro find microscope fine tune everything yeah like nitpicking fleas you know just like getting those little little bits out all right you're, i was gonna say you're more like gary but whatever like, more like detective <sighs> all right man all right so christina has to pee you guys so <laughs> things are throwing me under the bus we're yes, gonna take a little bit of a break so sit tight we will be right back thank you mama we'll be right back all right uh you're listening to the magnolia street podcast so much better okie doke oh. feel better i told you this was gonna be a fun one i feel better we're ready are we ready to deep dive into the cleaves family yes we're gonna do it now and there were multiple cleaves not just princess sybil correct notable historical figures that we can't talk about sybil and not talk about these other characters right that are are connected to her so just as a refresher the scenes in which sybil of cleve shows up this portrait is a renaissance style portrait by german painter barthel bruin the elder there mm -hmm. is a barthel bruin the younger did we talk about him at all in this i don't know and okay. they brothers i'm guessing they're brothers right or father and son or father and son oh that would make sense like a junior and a senior yeah yeah I guess yeah. back in the day, royalty anyway, I guess that's how they did the whole senior, junior thing. The elder guess, and the younger. Yeah, yeah that makes sense. Younger. Okay. So this portrait shows up at 30 minutes and 18. It's the oval frame beside the front door. We already talked about this. Then again at one hour eight, again, a glimpse of the frame when Gary comes for breakfast. And then one hour and 27 is the last time we see it when Sally walks into the house after they have their I wished for you to conversation. If you're following along visually, you already know what this painting looks like. If not, that's okay. We're going to talk about it shortly, but we're going to talk about Barthel Bruin the Elder. Who is the painter? What's his deal? <laughs> um, we're going to get into his life a little bit. So Bartholomew Bruin, usually called Bartholomew Bruin or Bartholomew Bruin the Elder, he lived from 1493 to 1555. And he was a German Renaissance painter active in Cologne. He painted altarpieces and portraits. He was Cologne's foremost portrait painter of his day. He was born in Wessel or Cologne. His early work suggests that he received an artistic training in the Lower Rhine. His earliest documented altarpiece was the Coronation of the Virgin, 1515, 1516. So it took a year to paint this Coronation of the Virgin. And it was commissioned by Dr. Peter von Klappis, a professor of the University of Cologne. Bruin's altarpiece of the 1510s and 1520s are influenced by the style of Jean Just. Guys, I don't know if I'm saying these right. I'm just guessing. <laughs> Sounds good to me. To whom Bruin was related and often emulated Just's habit of illuminating his figures from below. By the time Broom painted the Essen altarpiece, he combined Just's influence with that of Jus van Cleve. Okay, first connection there. Beginning, because I saw both. I saw Cleves and Cleve. Okay. With an S and without an S. And right. Sybil also has a couple different spellings. Beginning around 1525, 1525 they say, 1528 around there, Brun's religious paintings became increasingly Romanist and were influenced by the Italianate. There it is! <laughs> the I Italianate I style. And ornamentation of neighboring Netherlands artist Jean van Skorl and Martin van Hemskirk. Oh my god, these names. <laughs> Bruno's also an excellent portraitist 
who depicted many of Cologne's patrician citizens. In the 1530s, he developed more of a style that reflected examples of Raphael and Michelangelo, which he probably knew only at second hand through the engravings of Mark Anito. Mark Raman- just, say, just say it for me. Mark Antonio Raimondi. All right. See, the, the like Dutch ones, I kind of fumble my way through, not the Italian ones. As was filtered through the works of such artists as Jean van Scorl and Martin van Hemskerk. <laughs> Hey guys, I'm sorry. Rune is especially known for his portraits. He was the first important portrait painter in Cologne and the founder of the prolific school of portraiture that was continued by his son, Arndt, and Bartho Brun the Younger. There they are. There they are. His subjects were usually portrayed in half length against a flat background. The face is the center of the attention, but costume details are crisply described and prominence is given to the hands okay cool interesting 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 because if prominence is given to the hands do you think he would have painted maria because she like had the little bump on her hand well is it he Lina? died in 1550 oh right i think i say a little later on i think the difference between his i guess time period and her time period yeah there's about a century in between them. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> never mind that just like fucks up my theory <laughs> Art historian Jean M. Caswell says Brun's depictions of the upper middle class citizens of Cologne are, quote, lively and expressive, and they show no vain flattery. Brun did not sign his portraits, and some of them have in the past been misattributed to Hans Holbein, Holben, whatever, whose influence is apparent in Brun's work after 1539. Bartha Brun was a respected citizen of Cologne and active throughout his life in civic affairs. He was elected to the city council in 1549 and 1553 and died a wealthy man. His works are in numerous public collections, including the National Gallery in London, the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, and the Louvre in Paris. The Thiesenborn and Mesa Museum in Madrid owns a nativity and two portraits by Brune. Oh. Let's get into Princess Sybil. Yeah. So want to take who? some of this? Yeah. I have a cat. What oh, is going on? Oh, what happened? Did you get scared? He... I think you're trying to jump up, but there's all this shit in the way. <laughs> okay, bye, bye. Okay. Damn cats. And then Diggity's like, what the fuck? Poor baby. Here we go. All right, are we ready to dive in to Princess Sybil of Cleve? This woman is fascinating. Yeah, I didn't really read too much. I was copy pasting. You were copy pasting. I wasn't really reading too much ahead of time. I kind of want to be surprised. Okay. So are, there are actually multiple spellings of her name. Right? So Sybil, S-Y-B-I-L-L-E is the most common spelling, but there is also S-I-B-Y-L-L-E. So interesting, the difference of spelling. I guess it depends on the region or wherever you're from, like how they spell in their history books. I really don't know. Cleves. I was like, where's Cleves? What the hell's Cleves? So Cleves is a principality in the lower Rhinelands of what is now Germany in 1515. So I guess in 1515, it was referred to as Cleves. And this painting actually predates Maria's time by about a century. Because we know that Arthur Brune painted this painting in 1533 and Maria was born in 1664. So there was about 131 years in between both of their existences. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He couldn't have painted Maria. The painting, this is a 48.1 by 35.5 centimeter painting of oil on a panel. So I guess like wood, maybe? Maybe it's like a wood panel or something like that? Probably, yeah, gessoed or something. Because in the movie, the frame is oval. But this portrait is done on a panel. It's almost like taking a square canvas, but you take the top and you give it a little arc in the the center, Mm -hmm. almost like a, a headboard. It okay. looks like the shape of a headboard, but yeah, so yeah. probably a wooden panel that was carved with this shape. Interesting. Okay. So Sybil, the other daughter of Cleves, and this article is from TudorSociety.com. Tudor, Tudor nice. <laughs> and this article is titled Sybil, the other daughter of Cleves by Heather R. Darcy. Sybil von Cleve was born on January 17, 1512 in Dusseldorf. There you go. <laughs> the eldest of Maria von Julekberg's four children with Duke Johann von Cleve. Her siblings included Anne, Amalia, and Guillermo, which is their brother, only son, only boy. It sounds like Guillermo was separated from his sisters and parents to begin training as the heir. So I think we touch on this 
later on. Guillermo, wasn't he a duke? But anyway, the girls received what was thought of as poor education at the time. Their education would be based on religion, obedience, and domestic chores, knowing that their place would be as consorts and mothers. Rough. Their, yeah, their estate was considered detached and isolated from other courts of the time, remaining far from Italian, French, and English influences. I wonder why. It was just isolated. It probably didn't have a lot of con contact with uh, those outside countries. Okay. Also, question, did it say this was Dutch or this German, basically, right? Because mm -hmm. were the Germans, like, more stoic with their, like, presence? Mm -hmm. And I guess the Italian, the Spanish, the French, the, more of those, like, romance languages. They're kind of more a little flamboyant. Mm -hmm. They like, got a little more razzle-dazzle. Yeah, so I'm wondering if maybe they were kept from all of that, all of those cultures, because they erred on the side of the devil. Composure. The devil. <laughs> I don't know. It sounds like Germany is a little more on its own. Got it. To I just had a weird deja vu. Really? Weird deja vu. Yeah, I okay. feel like we've talked about this before. I don't know. <gasps> cool. Oh, strange, strange things that happen. <laughs> so Sybil was known as a great beauty, as can be seen from her engagement portrait by Lucas Carnage, the elder from 1526. Her long golden brown hair is loose and flowing about her shoulders. And I said, I think Barthel in this picture that hangs in the Owens house did her dirty because... This other portrait by Lucas is so pretty. It's so magical. It's very, very beautiful. Yeah. But I mean, she was a bit older when Barthel painted her, only by like seven years. But in the 1500s, maybe people aged a lot faster, even in just like a seven year span of time. Because if she was painted at the age of 14 by Lucas Cronach the Elder, that would have made her 21 by the time Barthel Brune painted her, which isn't mm -hmm. old at all nowadays. But back then, I think people of that time like that time period had harder lives in general and just aged much quicker and even had shorter lifespans and i mean the bubonic plague and tuberculosis and all other sorts of shit running rampant in those days and no vaccines no modern medicine so i mean people didn't right. you know didn't age well i mean with all <laughs> and those it things also coming. shows the probably the transition of her maidenhood and her mm -hmm. hair is down it's parted in the middle it's very loose yes. whereas the style that barthel had painted it's done up and at the time it was customary for women to pluck their hairlines way back they wanted that high freaking forehead right so that could also be the the trend for a woman of that you know a little older of a woman but i do one. agree with you he did do her dirty yeah. like yes. barcel i was i have this one hanging in my house this oh, other one oh the, i yeah. would have i would have oh. i don't but i would have it okay no i was gonna say just looking at barthel's rendition of her i would have i would think she was like well into her like 40s 50s maybe even 60s she didn't look like no 21 year old mm -mm. which is like what how old she would have been in this portrait if it was painted in 1533 also the aging of the material as well the yeah. the glazing and everything in this barthel picture it's kind of all muted colors they're kind of all similar there's not a lot of contrast and that could be the age of the picture because Perhaps. in the other photo there's so much more contrast and the colors are very vivid and her skin is like pale milky and her hair is fiery red it is way more whimsical mm -hmm. I think. also can i just point out who does she look like in this picture she looks like uh jillian antonia right yeah so maybe they are distant relatives how about that? How about that? Maybe. Cash me outside. <laughs> so um, very interesting juxtaposition between the two painters and the two ages that they would have been in these two different paintings. Yeah, check these paintings out, guys, if you get a chance. Mm -hmm. We love sharing this stuff, but it, I know it, this is a audio format, mm -hmm. but that's why we love putting this stuff in our show notes. Go to our Patreon. Be a part of it. Yeah. Learn history. Learn art. Also, check out our hero page because that's where we put all of the links and all the sources to everything that we're talking about. So you can even check out the sources if you want a little more extra. If you want to dig, if you want to go down those rabbit holes on your own, feel mm -hmm. free. The links are there. So the sitter is, I guess, what they would call a, a subject of a painting back in the day, right? Somebody who sits for the painting. Um, so it says in this section, it says the sitter is Sybil of Cleve at the age of 14. And this is the Carnage painting. Carnage stayed at the Saxon court. So a lot of portraits are of Saxon nobility. Sybil is represented here as a bride and is wearing a beautiful dress with a tight-waisted gown with slashed and puffed sleeves over a high-necked, how do you say that word? Chemise. Chemise. With a wide band at the neck, her loose hair, and the jeweled wreath of orange blossoms. Orange blossoms! Jerusha! <gasps> Jerusha! 
that uh and that <laughs> that'd be so much true shit today that is a bridal painting and interesting that you know they're kind of mentioning her fashion choices here we're gonna get a little into um i guess the fashion of the renaissance paintings a little later on which i'm excited to talk about i just love how she's wearing a flower crown i think that's so cute and it's got this like really long almost feathery like mm -hmm. plant like it's coming out of it it's very adorable yeah and she's 14 sitting 14. for a portrait of 14 for your engagement right oh wow. my god that's so young to be engaged and i'm sure she was engaged to somebody much fucking older we're gonna get there it's in the yeah Which we're getting super there super freaking creepy I, okay going back to the juxtaposition between both of these paintings from the 14 year old to 21 year old in this 14 year old painting it's a lot more whimsical looking very whimsical it's, the other one, it's a maidenhood right the other one looks a little more like her older painting when she was like 21 by barthel this one looks a little more religious it does, yeah. It looks more of like pious. A, a pious paint. Exactly, exactly. In September 1526, Sybil was betrothed to electoral prince John Frederick of Saxony in the Schlossberg on der Wupper. What the fuck is that? Schlossberg on der Wupper. Schlossberg on der Wupper. Wait, hold on. I need to look up. What the fuck is that? I guess a castle? It's a burg. It's a German castle located in Burgander, the largest reconstructed castle in North Rhine, Westphalia, Germany, and, pop and a popular tourist attraction. Oh, its early oh. history is closely connected to the rise of the Duchy of Burg. Oh, this is a rabbit okay. hole. Ah, this is such a rabbit hole. Okay, anyway. After lengthy negotiations about the dowry, the lavish wedding ceremony, preceded by an elaborate procession, took place in Torgau on February 9th, 1527. Sybil was 15 at the time, and Johann was 23. Yeah. Ew. Yikes. Ew, ew, ew. Eight years? About eight years? <sighs> yeah. She was elevated to the station of electress consort through her marriage to Johann Friedrich the first. Friedrich, Friedrich yeah. the you first. Ever see young Frankenstein. It's pronounced Frodrick von <laughs> Frankenstein. Is that the one with Gene Wilder? Yeah, yeah. and Marty Feldman. <laughs> The Elector of Saxony in 1532. I feel like I have to speak the whole thing this way. Sybil's husband held an important position as an elector in the Holy Roman Empire and acted as a mediator between the parties. The positions of elector was originally created in the 13th century with the purpose of electing the king of the Romans who in fact ruled over the Germans. So he's would, important. He's an would important you say, man. Frederick. Yeah, it seems so. So would you say her marriage to him was more of, the, of a political nature? It seems, yeah. Um, so electors were rulers of the, God, say this word, Reinstein imperial, imperial estates, enjoying precedence over the other imperial princes. They were, until the 18th century, exclusively entitled to be addressed with the title Durschlaut, <laughs> Serene, Serene Highness. That's dope. Yeah. Once crowned by the Pope, he became the Holy Roman Emperor. Electors were summoned quickly after the Emperor's death and met no less than three months after the Emperor died. During the interim, the Elector of Saxony would act as a vicar in partnership with the Elector Palatine. The need for papal recognition ended after Charles V. They had four sons, three of whom survived to adulthood. And the fact that they even mentioned that, maybe it was not a common occurrence to survive that long. No, not at all. <laughs> and they were all named John? <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> they named all four sons John? It's like, ah, uh, they just they like, they had a, what's the word? When you have too many options. Analysis paralysis. Analysis paralysis. Or... Maybe it's like George Foreman. He named all his sons George. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> God, like what the fuck? It's like I don't feel like putting much thought into it. They're just the same, all the same. It's fine. Yeah. So sadly, it seems she was not as an attentive mother as hers had been, and their youngest son didn't receive enough care in his younger years that he remained weak and sickly throughout his whole life. Yeah, sad. This reminds me of the whiny ass bitch boy from the Secret Garden, Colin. Colin, he get the fuck out of bed. He can walk the whole time. He wanted to be spoiled and catered to, and he didn't want anybody to know. He's pulling the wool over everybody's eyes. But this man, this other John, yeah. probably was uh, afflicted with a weak immune system, whereas this other boy in the Secret Garden, totally different story. Totally right. different story. Okay. So she neglected her child. Poor thing. Asshole of her. Um, the court Sybil enjoyed included a massive library, possibly the largest in Germany, at the time. As a reformist, Sybil energetically supported her husband's political actions and was respected by her fellow reformers. Justice Minius, one such reformer, dedicated his writing, O Economia Christiana to Sybil, 
quote, to the highborn electress Mistress Sybil, a duchess of Saxony, O Economia Christiana concerns the proper keeping of a Christian household. Lucas Cronach, the elder, and his workshop would go on to produce many portraits of Sybil and her family, including one finished in 1531, when Sybil was 29. In the 1531 portrait of Sybil, so we see that she likely plucked back her hairline, which is what you were saying before, as was fashionable in the period as a high forehead showed that a woman was of noble bearing and intelligent. Interesting. Big brain. Big brain. <laughs> Big old brain in there. <laughs> yes. Johann Friedrich led the, how do you say this word, Schmalkaldic Schmalkald League, which acted as a defensive alliance of the Lutheran princes. The Schmalkaldic League had a powerful military, which was part of Cromwell's reasoning for proposing Anna as a bride to Henry VIII. The main purpose of the League was to protect the Protestant states from an attack by the Catholic Charles V Holy Roman Emperor. Francis I of France was in support of the League from approximately 1535 to roughly 1544. We can't talk about Sybil without talking about her younger sister, Anne. Anne of Cleve was Henry VIII's fourth wife, who claimed Anne was, quote, ugly. Mm hmm We, yeah, so we did talk a little bit about Henry in our Rose episode, which was episode number 40, so go check that out if you want to hear a little bit more about that. And now we have to note that at the time, Anne met 49-year-old Henry. He was massively obese with a foul-smelling ulcerated leg from a jousting accident many years prior and Anne didn't recognize the king in person after seeing his many portraits which as you can imagine bruised Henry's ego right <laughs> by all other accounts Anne was indeed attractive but Henry's opinion of her was already made up after their first meeting he ultimately after only six months with Anne moved on to Catherine Howard how about that so she got away Right, okay. she. I don't think she was beheaded. Okay, because okay. Henry the Eighth, I am, I am, mm -hmm. like the. Right. It is out of Sybil's husband's court that Martin Luther, who hid there in the 1520s, translated the New Testament of the Bible into German and laid the groundwork for unifying the Germanic areas through language. Sybil corresponded with Martin Luther and appears to have supported her husband's radical actions to reform the church. That's amazing that they were a part of that massive mm -hmm. reformation. Yeah. That's so cool. Yeah. Didn't know that that would be coming around in our Practical Magic podcast. You never know what's going to come around. If the Rosicrucians pop up in this article, because we've already <laughs> talked about them how many freaking times, they keep popping up everywhere. Them and Billy Zane. <laughs> Charles V was preoccupied with other wars in his territories and did not turn his attention back to Germany until the mid to late 1540s when the Schmalkaldic Wars broke out. Johann Friedrich was captured by Charles V and held captive for five years. Despite the rumors of an initial cold marriage at the beginning, letters between John and Sybil during this time show that they were very intimate and a very loving couple. In the meantime, Sybil bravely defended Wittenberg to protect her sons and hold her husband's territory. Johann Friedrich finally capitulated and ended the siege but remained a prisoner of Charles V until 1554 what a badass right just taking up her husband's mantle mm -hmm. holding down the fort protecting yeah. her kids protecting her estate country yeah. her people yeah whoever she was in charge of mm -hmm. like that's amazing it kind of again it gives me now i know this is a different character or different person altogether but it gives me claire vibes from outlander because she was like jamie's like right hand woman like they were like partners and everything even mm -hmm. through like you know his time in the war and like fending yep. off troops and stuff so sybil and anna were known to exchange letters until sybil's death in 1554 and were known to have a strong bond as well sybil was would have been able to share Anna's woe of having an obese husband at his largest. There were a few horses in all of Saxony that could support the weight of Johann Friedrich. Oh my so god. Johann was also a large man. Okay. Perhaps the sisters discussed how best to manage their husbands, exchanging letters and gifts in anticipation of Anna's marriage to Henry VIII of England some 13 years after Sybil's marriage. <laughs> Sybil died in February 9th, 1554 at 42 years old which is super young um, in today's day and age. Right, so the shortly, life expectancy. Right. Yeah, so short. Okay, so she died shortly after being reunited with her husband, who she dearly loved. Johann Friedrich followed Sybil a month later in March 1554. Do you think he died of a broken heart? Yeah, I do. 
and the couples were buried together in the city church of Weimar. They died within one month of each other. Her remains are laid to rest in the church of St. Pete and St. Paul in Weimar, Germany. And Sybil was said time and time again to be a woman of great character. She was a great defender of the Catholics' reformation, even facing imperial troops resisting a siege with her children as best she could while her husband was imprisoned. Holy Fascinating shit. Fascinating character. All the stress? No wonder why she died at 42 years old. I like, know. The stress on top of all the rampant diseases back then? <laughs> yeah, Holy it's shit. just so sad that he passed. So he was eight years older than her, so 51, something like that. Still young. Still young. Still young. Yeah. yeah. So that was from a bunch of different sources yeah. I threw together. Artandspace.blogspot, pubheist.com, wiki, portrait in a minute, history of London, Wikipedia. I had to look up what an elector, electress was i was like i don't know what that is and the biopic channel on youtube had a lot of that information okay interesting so i wanted to just touch on what you said earlier we were trying to figure out the math the years who got painted first how this portrait came to this house maria only came to america in the 1600s yeah how did this portrait painted in what do we say the 1500s, 1500s. yeah get here what is this family connection did hannah no royalty is my question and justine and i did a little digging in the books and there is some some mention of possible royalty so uh, i don't i didn't write down the pages but it says in magic lessons hannah had been orphaned herself but she had been raised in the scullery of a royal house to do kitchen work and there the tutor of the family's sons had taken it upon himself to allow her into the library and teach her how to read mm. that's the first clue okay we don't find we don't find the the answer but i'm just no. putting the putting this out there is something right. to think about the second thing comes up saying she's talking about the man who convicted her and she says he was a man like any other an earl's servant who had had seven years to work off his debt what's an earl's servant like a butler probably okay, like okay. Right -hand man. got it you know, scrub the shit off my boots kind of <laughs> so she worked for royalty and she apparently kind of worked in and around she knew other people who worked for royalty mm -hmm. so i'm wondering i don't know i don't even know how to speculate how this portrait would have gotten to their house Wait. unless they are just auction goers and they were like this thing's up for auction and the aunts are just buying portraits they're like give me it we don't even know if the aunts bought it or acquired it it could have been isabel or it could have been before isabel it exactly. could have been rose do it decatur because she <laughs> and exactly. owens family Exactly. There's just so many theories, man. I don't know. If you guys have thoughts, we'd love to know them. Write us at Magnolia Street Podcast at gmail.com if you have any theories or ideas about any of these paintings mentioned in this movie, in the books. We'd love to know your thoughts because it's it's a this is a rabbit hole. This entire episode is a rabbit hole. I like that they included, I'm not sure what source it was, but to say how close of a relationship Sybil and Anne had. This movie is all about sisterly womanhood relationships. So mm -hmm. I think that's a really cool little Easter egg that they threw in. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about Anne of Cleves in a second. But I I'm wondering if maybe that's why they included the portrait. Is because maybe they knew like the royalty connection and the sisterly affection connection. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Anne. Who are the other Cleves in this yeah. family? Yeah. Again, guys, I'm just going to touch on we have timestamps. If you're not into the Cleves and you're not into the 1500s aristocrat lifestyle, we got you. Yeah. But Anne of Cleves, sister to Sybil, uh, was born in 1515 and she passed away July 16th, 1557. She was the Queen of England from the 6th of January to the 12th of July of 1540. Not very long. She was the fourth wife of Henry VIII. Not much is known about Anne before 1527, when she became betrothed to Francis, Duke of Bar, son and heir of Antoine, Duke of Lorraine. Although her marriage did not proceed, in March 1539, negotiations for Anne's marriage to Henry began, as Henry believed that he needed to form a political alliance with her brother, William. So I think, is Guillermo another name, another like variation of William, I'm Maybe. thinking? Because he is the being trained to be the heir. Right. Yeah, William the First of Cleves okay. is his name. Okay, so it's probably William, but that one YouTube video I told you was in Spanish, mm. but yeah. it was like cc'd in english so yeah yeah that's what i wrote down. he's also yeah. known as william the rich hell yeah Look on his that. wiki page <laughs> yeah anyway he'd be i think he'd be happy to know he had that nomenclature right he he looks pretty gangsta he's got like a pimp cane show me <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> Show me. Pixar, it didn't happen. <laughs> Hold on. It's incoming in the chat. Hold on. Okay. Let me show you this. Look at this. Dude, you can't even tell me that he's not pimping. Look at that. Look at that picture. Ooh. Is that a hat or is that a background? I think that's a big ass circle. I don't think that's a big hat. I think that's a background. But look at him. He got, he's got a glass of wine in one hand uh -huh. and a pimp cane in the other hand. <laughs> yeah. And a cloak. It's amazing. And a fucking cloak. So he was the leader of the Protestants of West Germany to strengthen his position. So Henry wanted to form an alliance with William to strengthen his position against potential attacks from the Catholic um, France and the Holy Roman Empire at the time. Anne arrived in England on December 27th, 1539, right before Christmas, and married Henry on January 6th, 1540. But after six months, the marriage was declared unconsummated. And as a result, she was not crowned queen consort. Following the annulment, Henry gave her a generous settlement and she was thereafter known as the king's beloved sister. Hmm. Remaining in England, she lived to see the reign of Edward VI and the coronation of Mary I, outliving the rest of Henry's wives. Amazing. Oh, yeah. Oh, this probably doesn't have any connection, but it's interesting that she's connected to a man whose all his wives die, but also to a family whose husbands all die. Oh my god! Very interesting. Okay. Awesome connection. I like that. <laughs> she was born in 1515, either on September 22nd or more probably June 28th. I guess they're not sure. What? That's a big, she like, span of time to not be sure. <laughs> <laughs> she was born in Dusseldorf, the second daughter of John III of the House of Lamarck, Duke of Ulrich Plevesberg. There's a bunch of okay. German here. Hang on. Yeah, yeah. So the court of Mark, also known as De La Marck and Ravensburg. That's a dope name. <laughs> Often referred to as the Duke of Cleves, who died in 1538, and his wife Maria, the Duchess of Ulrichburg. That reminds me of uh, Ulrich von Liechtenstein. Is that from? Knight's Tale. I don't remember that. What? I've seen that like once. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. She grew up in Schlossberg on the edge of Solingen. Anne's father was influenced by the Erasmus and followed a moderate path within the Reformation. He decided to side with the, say that word again for me? Malkaldic. Schmacaldic. It just sounds so made up. I know. Schmacaldic League and opposed Emperor Charles V. After John's death, Anne's brother William became Duke of Earl of Clevesburg, bearing the promising epitaph, The Rich. There it is. Quote, as, there it is. In 1526, her elder sister Sybil was married to Jean Frederick, Elector of Saxony, head of the Protestant Confederation of Germany, and considered the champion <laughs> of the Reformation. In 1527, at age 11, Oh, Jesus Christ is so much younger than yeah. even her sister. Anne was betrothed to Francis. Oh my God. The nine-year-old son and heir of Antoine, Duke of Lorraine. I think, you know, these olden, these olden times, people are marrying like, okay, your daughter's going to marry my son when they're of legal age, I hope. But usually there was they're no like, such thing as legal back then. It just was like, yes. okay, you're marrying this person for this political purpose. All political. It's all political. An all-class yeah. system, like you yeah. marry up or you marry this person because they're going to get you a royal status or, you know, something of the sort. Well, here it is. It says, but because Francis was under the age of consent, okay. 10 years old at the time of the arrangement, the betrothal was considered unofficial and was canceled oh in 1535. Okay. All right. So they had some boundaries, but 10? Yeah, 10 years old? <sighs> Her brother, William, was a Lutheran, but the family was unaligned religiously, with her mother, the Duchess Maria, described as a, quote, strict Catholic. Her father's ongoing dispute over Gelderland oh. with Charles V made the family suitable allies for England's King Henry VIII in the wake of the Truce of Nietzsche. Nice? Nice. N-I-C-E. The match with Anne was urged on the king by the chief minister, Thomas Cromwell. We're going to talk a little bit about wedding preparations. Uh, we have a portrait, a miniature portrait of Anne of Cleves we're going to share in our notes. Again, I think Henry VIII was a little butthurt. She don't look that ugly to me. No. What do I know? So this portrait, it says, the artist Hans Holborn, the younger, was dispatched to Durin to paint portraits of Anne and her younger sister, Amalia, each of whom Henry was considering as his fourth wife. Henry required the artist to be as accurate as possible, not to flatter the sisters. The portraits are now located in the Louvre Museum in Paris and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. 
another 1539 portrait by the school of the Bartholomew Bruin the Elder is in the collection of the Trinity College in Cambridge. So he's asking this portraitist basically to be like his wingman, like go and like see what they look like. Like tell me what they look like. He's the guy looking at the Facebook, uh, you know, the pictures, like what she really look like. Yeah, yeah, you know? yeah. He's, uh, he's um, internet stalking before oh it's time. Gosh. Negotiations to arrange the marriage were in full swing by March 1539. Thomas Cromwell oversaw the talks and marriage treaty. The marriage treaty was signed on October 4th of that year. The king agreed to pay a dowry of 100,000 florins to the bride's brother, William. Henry valued education and cultural sophistication in women, and Anne lacked these traits. Which is weird, because they were saying earlier that their education, well, I guess it makes sense, because they didn't have a good education. Right. You know, the sisters, right? They were hidden away they, from society, basically. Yeah, but I thought their education was for being a wife, you know? Oh, but... right, yeah. So it makes no sense that maybe they just, like, they wanted nothing to do with domesticity. Not yeah, even motherhood. So he, he wanted, so Henry wanted somebody to bear his children, be motherly, but also be educated and culturally sophisticated, which apparently Anne, Sybil, and Amalia didn't get a good education. So that probably influenced that a lot. We I'm wondering like what their parents were like because like they must not have had good mentors. No guidance. No guidance. She had received no formal education but was skilled in needlework and liked playing card games. She could read and write but only in German. Nevertheless, Anne was considered gentle, virtuous, and docile, which is why she was recommended as a suitable candidate for Henry. Anne was described by French ambassador Charles de Marillac as tall and slim, in quote, of middling beauty and a very assured and resolute countenance. That's bullshit. Middling beauty? Oh, God. She was fair-haired and was said to have had a lovely face. In the words of the chronicler Edward Hall, quote, her hair hanging down, which was fair, yellow, and long. She was appareled after the English fashion with a French hood, which so set forth her beauty and good visage that every culture rejoiced to behold her, end quote. She appeared rather solemn by English standards and looked old for her age. Holbein painted her with a high forehead, heavy lidded eyes, and a pointed chin. Interesting. Why would he do that? Well, they said that the high forehead was a sign of like great noble yeah. oh yeah that's true yeah Anne was initially to travel to england along with her cortege the death of her father prevented her brother and mother from traveling but there were concerns about a beautiful sheltered young woman who had never traveled by sea making such a journey especially during the winter she traveled from dusseldorf to cleves and then antwerp where she was received by 50 english merchants that's not intimidating. Henry met her privately on New Year's Day, 1540, at Rochester Abbey in Rochester on her journey from Dover. Henry and some of his courtiers, following a courtly love tradition, went disguised into a room where Anne was staying. Eustace Chapius reported. So it says, The king so went up into the chamber where the said Lady Anne was looking out of a window to see the bull baiting which was going on in the courtyard, and suddenly he embraced and kissed her and showed her a token which the king had sent for her New Year's gift. And she, being abashed and not knowing who it was, thanked him, and so he spoke with her. Wait a minute. So he just snuck up on her, laid one on her, and she, like, didn't even know who he was? Right, because because from all his portraits, like we learned in the civil portion, he was painted in a certain way, but apparently he is massively obese, his leg stinks, and he's probably not brushing his teeth. <laughs> his leg stinks? <laughs> ah, stink leg. That's disgusting. That's nasty. No. A nasty leg. But she regarded him little, but always looked out the window, and when the king saw that she took so little notice of his coming, he went into another chamber and took off his cloak and came in again in a coat of purple velvet. And when the lords and knights saw his grace, they did him reverence. According to the testimony of Henry's companions, he was disappointed with Anne, feeling that she was not as described, according <gasps> to the, yeah, according to the chronicler. Charles oh my god, wait! Did she catfish him? <laughs> <laughs> I think the portraitist catfished him. Oh my god! Catfishing because before he, catfishing. He was just butthurt that she didn't recognize him as the king. <laughs> <laughs> because okay when we catfish like in modern times like yeah it's just like you can send somebody a picture and it's whatever the effort to catfish somebody back then to sit for hours 
to get painted like that to like like pull the wool over somebody's eyes she had no control what the guy was painting that is so impressive (laughs) (laughs) i love where your mind went that's awesome oh my god that's amazing funny awesome (laughs) according to chronicler charles ryle thesley and quote regarded him little though it is unknown whether she knew it was the king henry then revealed his true identity to anne although he is said to have been put off the marriage from then on henry and anne then officially met on january 3rd on blackheath outside the gates of greenwich park where the grand reception was laid out most historians believe that henry's misgivings about the marriage were blamed on anne's alleged unsatisfactory appearance and her failure Failure to inspire him to consummate the marriage. Failure to inspire him? You mean like he was not sexually attracted to her? That sucks. (laughs) He he fucking catfished him, bro. (laughs) Got him. But she's the only one that like lived. Got him. Got him. Amazing. I am so impressed by her right now. Like the length she went to to fucking catfish. Oh my god, okay. He felt that he had been misled after his advisors had praised Anne's beauty. Quote, she is nothing so far as she hath been reported, he complained. (laughs) Cromwell received some blame for the Holbein portrait, which Henry believed had not been an accurate representation of Anne, and some of the exaggerated reports of her beauty. When the king finally met Anne, he was reportedly shocked by her plain appearance, and the marriage was never consummated. Wow. Henry urged Cromwell to find a legal way to avoid the marriage, but... But by this point, doing so was impossible without endangering the vital alliance with the Germans. In his anger and frustration, the king turned on Cromwell to his subsequent regret. How do you think he uh, ended up there? How do you think uh, Cromwell, do you Wait, think Henry killed him? That- Cromwell was Henry's advisor who was like, yeah, she's pretty. She's this, she's that. And Henry was like, you fucking lied to me, bro. <laughs> oh, he, dude, he was thrown in the moat. Are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was yeah. thrown in the moat. In the chokey. In the chokey. <laughs> <laughs> There's no doubt about it. He probably just like killed him off. Yikes. He was never seen again. He was swimming Yikes. with the fishes at that point. So Bartholomew Bruin, who we just talked about, the elder, also did a portrait of Anne in the 1540s. Despite Henry's very vocal misgivings, the two were married on January 6, 1540 at the royal palace of Placenta. No. Placentia. Okay. Placentia. But still. It's yeah, but close. still. Palace of Placentia in Greenwich, London by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer. The phrase, quote, God send me well to keep, end quote, was engraved around Anne's wedding ring immediately after arriving in England and conformed to the Catholic form of worship which Henry had retained after his break with Rome. The couple's first night as husband and wife was not a successful one. Henry confided to Cromwell that he had not consummated the marriage, saying, quote, I liked her before, not well, but now I like her much worse. Oh, wow. wow. That's rough. Okay, so Cromwell is still alive at this point. Yes. So I wonder at what point does he finally just like throw him out a castle window and he like, falls know. in a pit of alligators. <laughs> Poor Anne. Oh my god, this is amazing. Dude, this is fucking juicy. This is like the tea. This needs to be a Netflix show. I would watch Well, don't they have the Tudors TV show? Yeah, probably. I don't know if they cover all this though. This is this is a this is a I'd be interested. Right. This is a tasty morsel. Keep going, please. I need to know what happens. Should I do this like it's actual tea? So like in February 1540, like speaking of like the Countess of Rutledge. Oh my God. Anne praised the king as a kind husband saying, get this, we're going to stop. I said, so she says, when he comes to bed, he kisseth me and then he taketh me by the hand and biddeth me good night, sweetheart. And in the morning kisseth me and biddeth farewell, darling, end quote. Lady Rutledge responded, Madam, there must be more than this, or it will be long ere we have a Duke of York, which all this realm most desireth. So basically, like, you need to start consummating the shit so you could pop out some kids to kind of, like, form as an heir to the throne. Yes. Right. Did you watch uh, Bridgerton, the Charlotte series that just came I out? I started watching it, but then, like, I just fell off because I started doing okay. watching other shit. I don't know. It's I have very ADD. similar. They're okay. like, it's not legal unless you sex. Right. And then, like, the king's mother at the time, she was like, I had 11 people and a priest in the room when I consummated my marriage. Wait, question. I don't know much about royals, but do they have to have a witness of consummation? How do they know? How will they know? They did. Um, because usually the staff would check the bed sheets. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Oh, Jesus. And if it, <laughs> and if it wasn't, like, immediately, oh, Jesus, that was a good one. 
That's disgusting. Go on. So they needed a witness? They would check for menstruation also monthly. So God. if she was still menstruating, she wasn't pregnant. Right. Which means they might not have done it. Also, do you know in the Jewish faith, after the ceremony or after like, you know, they get married, the couple goes into a room and I think somebody has to stand outside the door as like a witness to like, or they have no. to come, they have to consummate like right after the ceremony. Oh, wow. Don't quote me on this, but we went to a wedding of our friends, like, you know, one of them was Catholic, the woman was Jewish, and then right after the ceremony, they had to, like, go off and be by, I don't know if they had to consummate or if they just, like, had to spend a moment alone, but we're pretty sure that's what was going on. What? <laughs> I don't know that's if that's crazy. for every, I don't know if that's for, like, the, the faith in general or if. Or if it was just like, that's just what they wanted. I'm going to have to ask Rachel. Yeah, ask somebody because I could be completely wrong. Don't quote me on this. All right, what happened? I need to know. What's his face? Cromwell. I need to know his know. Oh. Do we have more on Cromwell? Let's see. Anne was commanded to leave the court on June 24th. And on the 6th of July, she was informed of her husband's decisions to reconsider the marriage. Witness statements were taken from a number of courtiers and two physicians, which registered the king's disappointment in her appearance. This what? Henry had also commented to Thomas Peniage and Anthony Denny that he could not believe she was a virgin. Wait, he could not he could not believe she was a virgin? Yeah. Weird. Okay, um, we're gonna go with it. Well, I mean, like if she was that unattractive. Maybe he means like she was. she's working on the streets. Oh. Like she she was a, it says she was a virgin, right? He couldn't believe that she was a virgin. Because they so, never consummated it, so how would he know? Right. Unless the physicians that they're talking about kind of like check her to make, to see what, Oh. You know? You know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, a number of courtiers and two physicians. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. Shortly afterward, Anne was asked for her consent to an annulment, which she agreed. Cromwell, the moving force behind the marriage, was attained for treason there it is there oh it is oh my god the marriage was annulled on july 12 1540 on the grounds of non-consummation and her pre-contract to francis of lorraine um i thought that would keep going on the grounds of non-consummation and her oh okay they're saying because she was already pre-contracted to marry francis of lorraine okay Henry VIII's physician stated that after the wedding night, Henry said he was not impotent because he experienced, I don't know what this says, just need to take that, he experienced Trois pollutions nocturnes in somno. Two nocturnal pollutions while in sleep. So does that mean like he like jizz in his sleep? Like what does that mean? Like what does he? Jizz Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus Christ did in his sleep? He just, yep. Yep. That was that very was the, good Latin. Uh, I, I, I do what I can. <laughs> Um, so did Anne, apparently. Poor thing. Oh, man. And then Cromwell, treason. So wait. Attained for treason. Did he, they, they kill him? I don't know. No, attained. So I guess he was thrown in jail. Treason is the crime of attacking a state authority to which one owes allegiance. This typically includes acts such as participating in a war against one's native country, attempting to overthrow its government, spying on its military, its diplomats, or its secret services for hostile and foreign power, or attempting to kill its head of state. Um, I'm wondering so, if they took it so much as like, he, he lied to the king, basically. Lied, right. And also, do you think Cromwell had alternative or ulterior motives? Do you think he was like, I want to get with Anne? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe I'll tell the king that, you know, if he doesn't marry her, then, then I could be with her. I don't fucking know. I don't, I don't know. know. It doesn't that, matter because now like he's in jail. job harder. I know. Okay. Dude, this was, this was juicy. This was juicy. Okay, so Anne had been given dower lands in January of 1540 to fund her household, including manors in Hampshire formerly owned by Briamore Priory and Southwick Priory. I don't know what a priory is. As former queen, she received a generous settlement, including Richmond Palace and Hever Castle, home of Henry's former in-laws, the Bolins. Like Anne Bolin? Yes. yes oh, shit. A power of Priory is a monastery of men or women under religious vows that is headed by a prior or a prioress. Okay. So yeah. now she owns some monastery. She owns a castle. Dude, that is not a bad settlement. Rolling it up. <laughs> All right, so she she made good in that in that deal. So Anne of Cleves House in Lewes, East Sussex is just one of many properties she owned, though she never lived there. Henry and Anne became good friends. Oh, wait, hold up. So they got divorced. <laughs> whoa, whoa, whoa. Wait, 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 wait. So they got divorced, but now they're like BFFs? Okay. 
Okay, she was an honorary member of the king's family and was referred to as the king's beloved sister. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. She was invited to court often and out of gratitude for her not contesting the annulment, Henry decreed that she would be given precedence over all women in England save his own wife and daughters. Mm -hmm. After Catherine Howard... All right, so Catherine Howard was the woman that he left her for? Yes. Okay, the mistress. Do you think, do you think they were having like a little thing on the side, like oh, for yeah. their annulment? Yeah. All right. So after Catherine Howard, she was beheaded. So after that, Anne and her brother William, Duke of Julek Clevesburg, pressed the king to remarry Anne. Henry quickly refused to do so. She seems to have disliked Catherine Parr. Wait, Catherine Parr and Catherine Howard. Those are two different people? So she seems to have disliked Catherine Parr and reportedly reacted to the news of Henry's sixth marriage with the remark, Madame Parr is taking a great burden on herself. Yeah, Catherine Parr was the sixth wife of yeah. Henry VIII. All right, so he married two Catherines in a row. Wait, did he marry Catherine Howard? It goes Catherine of Argonne, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, Catherine Parr. Three Catherines and like two Anne. I know, must be a very popular name. And Jane Seymour, isn't that an actress? Isn't that an actress? <laughs> Probably. Um, wasn't she like the uh, medicine lady? What's her name? You know what I'm talking about? medicine lady oh i know who you're talking about medicine woman what's yes. her face dr quinn dr quinn medicine <laughs> <laughs> right what's her name what, is that her real name that's her Jane real Seymour? name yeah that's her real okay. name okay i wonder if there's relation i wonder yeah mm. she's an english actress okay anyway so yeah he married quite a few catherines he had quite a few wives he's and... got a type well he's got a type he's got a type yeah so in march 50 i wonder okay did we ever establish why catherine howard was beheaded uh because he wasn't able to divorce yet she probably didn't want to have an annulment so he's like i'll just kill her because in the religion he couldn't get divorced Mm. and then that the whole reformation was happening right and okay. then afterward this the split it became the church of england under him okay and then divorce they made legal i think oh, wait what was her name catherine what howard let's see death where is it downfall okay so it says catherine may have been involved during her marriage to the king with henry's favorite male courtier thomas culpepper culpepper <laughs> shut up culpepper shut the fuck up right now Whoa. Okay, Thomas Culpepper was an English courtier and close friend of Henry VIII and was related to two of his queens, Anne Boleyn and Catherine Howard. He is known to have had many private meetings with Catherine after her marriage, though these may have involved political intrigue rather than sex. So treason, maybe? Okay. okay. Interesting, Interesting, right? Holy shit. Dude, these royals, so fucking juicy. <laughs> juicy. I'm like... I feel like I'm watching like the Real Housewives of, uh, I don't know, fucking know. Whoever said history wasn't fun, like, fuck you. This stuff's awesome. The Real Housewives of Cleves. Of Cleves. <laughs> yeah, so she was involved with Henry's favorite courtier, Culpepper, a young man who had succeeded him in the Queen's affections. According to Dara Ham's later testimony, she had considered marrying Culpepper during her time as a maid of honor to Anne of Cleves. Culpepper called Catherine my little sweet fool in a love letter. It has been alleged that in spring of 1540. Wait, wait, wait. Culpepper. We're thinking of Thomas Cromwell, not Culpepper. No, I'm thinking of Culpepper as in the botanist that we mentioned episodes ago. Oh, I was like, oh, that's the treason that they got him for. Go ahead. Continue. Okay. No, I was just laughing at the connection of Culpepper because we talked about a different Culpepper in the past. But... Yes, 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 yes. Um, so it has been alleged that in spring 1541, the pair were meeting secretly. Their meetings were allegedly arranged by one of Catherine's older ladies-in-waiting, Jane Boleyn, Viscountess Rochford, also known as Lady Rochford, the widow of Catherine's executed cousin, George Boleyn, and Boleyn's brother. This so, is... right? Isn't this nuts? People who claim to have witnessed her earlier sexual behavior while she lived at Lambeth reportedly contacted her for favors in return for their silence, and some of these blackmailers may have been appointed to her royal household. John Lassels, a supporter of Cromwell, there's the Cromwell, approached the Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Cranmer, telling him that his sister Mary refused to become a part of Queen Catherine's household, stating that she had witnessed the quote light ways of queen catherine <laughs> while they were together at lambeth oh, Cranmer damn. then interrogated mary lassels who alleged that catherine had had sexual encounters or relations while under the duchess of norfolk's care before her relationship with the king i got it 
Yeah, so Cramer immediately took up this case to top his rivals, the Roman Catholic Norfolk family. Lady Rochford was interrogated, and as she feared that she would be tortured, she agreed to talk. She told how she had watched for Catherine backstairs as Culpepper had made his escape from the Queen's room. During the investigation, a love letter written in the Queen's distinctive handwriting was found in Culpepper's chambers. This is the only letter of hers that has survived other than her later confession, or quote confession. And the the letter, the actual letter, do you see it on the wiki page? They have the actual letter here on the wiki page. We're we're gonna link this shit, this is crazy. So it says, on All Saints Day, November 1st, 1541, the king arranged to be found praying in in the Chapel Royal. There he received a letter describing the allegations against Catherine. On November 7th, 1541, Archbishop Cranmer led a delegation of counselors to Winchester Palace in Southwark to question her. Even the staunch Cranmer found the teenage Catherine's frantic, incoherent state pitiable, saying... I found her in such lamentation and heaviness as I never saw no creature, so that it would have pitied any man's heart to have looked upon her. He ordered the guards to remove any object she might use to commit suicide. (laughs) Oh my god! This could be a whole side episode, but she was eventually beheaded and put to death. Gotcha. We'll end that there. Okay. Ooh, that's a lot of tea. So she was beheaded. Anne and her brother, William, Duke of Julia Cleavesburg, pressed the king to remarry Anne. Henry quickly refused to do so. She seems to have disliked Catherine Parr and reportedly reacted to the news of Henry VI's marriage with the remark, Madame Parr is taking a grand burden on herself. In March 1547, mm-hmm. Edward VI Privy Council asked her to move out of Letchingley Palace, her usual residence, to Penhurst Place to make her way for Thomas Cowardin, Master of Revels. They pointed out that Penhurst was nearer to have Hever and the move had been Henry VIII's will. On August 4th, 1553, Anne wrote to Mary I to congratulate her on her marriage to Philip of Spain. On September 28th, 1553, when Mary left St. James Palace for Whitehall, she was accompanied by her sister Elizabeth and Anne of Cleves. Anne also took part in Mary I's coronation procession and may have been present in her coronation at Westminster Abbey. These were her last public appearances. As the new queen was a strict Catholic, Anne yet again changed religion, now becoming a Roman Catholic. After a brief return to prominence, she lost royal favor in 1554 following Wyatt's rebellion. According to Simon Renard, the imperial ambassador, Anne's close association with Elizabeth had convinced the queen that the Lady Anne of Cleves was of the plot and intrigued with the Duke of Cleves to obtain help for Elizabeth, matters in which the King of France was the prime mover. There is no evidence that Anne was invited back to the court after 1554. She was compelled to live in a quiet, obscure life on her estates. After her arrival at the King's Bride, Anne never left England despite occasional feelings of homesickness and was generally content in England and was described by Hollinshed as, quote, a lady of right commendable regards, courteous, gentle, a good housekeeper, and very bountiful to her servants. So quite the opposite of her sister, Princess Sybil, who was like not very good at all that stuff. Not a good house, but it's very brave and mm. she, I think they said she was also commendable. Okay. But I wonder if they in ever other ways. met again. I wonder if they ever traveled to meet each other because all we know is that the sisters shared letters back and forth yeah which sally and jillian Mm. shared a letter right so yeah interesting life my gosh and the only wife to she outlived all the wives yeah wow all right so her death when anne's health began to fail mary allowed her to live at chelsea old manor where henry's last wife catherine parr had lived after her remarriage here in the middle of july 1557 anne dictated her last will in it she mentions her brother sister and sister-in-law as well as the future queen elizabeth the duchess of suffolk and the countess of arundel she left some money to her servants and asked mary and elizabeth to employ them in their households she was remembered by everyone who served her as a particularly generous and easygoing mistress. Aww. Anne died at Chelsea Old Manor on July 16, 1557. The most likely cause of her death was cancer. She was buried in Westminster Abbey on August 3rd in what has been described as a, quote, somewhat hard to find tomb on the oh. opposite side of Edward the Confessor's Shrine and slightly above eye level for a person of average height. And Anne's epitaph in Westminster Abbey, which is in English, reads, simply Anne of Cleves, Queen of England, born 1515, died 1557. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's amazing that they gave her that Queen of England title because 
as we learned, it was never consummated. So right. she was never legally known to be queen consort. Right. But on her grave, they, they put that there for her. Yeah. Very okay. nice. All right. If you guys want to know more about the other siblings, Amalia and William the Rich, we'll post that in our show notes so you guys can go read more about them. Uh, but we're going to take a break right now. And when we come back, we're going to do a card poll. And we're going to talk about the other artists and their featured paintings in the movie. So we will be right back. Hey, we're the Stinas, and you're listening to Magnolia Street Podcast. Okay, Ooh, that was, dude, that was wild. That's a rabbit. Thank you for bringing us through the end of that. Just Henry's, like, ego. She, she was ugly. You didn't tell me she was that ugly. I don't want to have sex with her. No, I, I'm not impotent because I went this morning <laughs> on accident. <laughs> on accident. Poor Anne. Yeah, that sucks. But uh, anyway, if you guys have a theory of why Sybil's portrait is hanging in the Owens house, let us know. Maybe it, Anne is the, the missing link, but she is so such a notable historic figure. We had to put her in there. Mm -hmm. And Justina did all the research for the other siblings. So if you want to learn more about them, they will be in our show notes. Yeah. Amalia and the other dude, right? The only son? William the Rich. William the Rich? Was that him? Yeah. Right. Get them all. Gear. Oh, yeah. We're shuffling. Every day I'm shuffling. <laughs> Okay. Stop. Mm-hmm. Okay. I feel like we keep pulling the same cards. Did we pull this before? No, Almost. Because... Dude, Lionsgate 8 8 manifest card. Oh shit. Yeah, it is. Okay, so yeah, today is the Lionsgate and we pulled the manifest card, the Amas Veritas card. How about that? Have we pulled this card before? I don't even remember now. Maybe I'm just used to seeing it on my desk, so I'm like... Right, yeah. All right, I don't know if we've pulled this card before, but anyway. This says manifest and visualization. So, there is so much magic around you and in everything. More importantly, there is magic inside of you. Know, remember, and tap into it. You have the power to create anything you want or need. Focus your energy and set your intentions. Make magic happen. Don't just hope that things work out. Ensure that they do. And again, that, that comes with like inspired action, like taking actually taking action so remember to also do your part take the time to visualize a clear and distinct path as well as the next steps in your spiritual journey connect with thank and work in unison with the greater energies harness the magic and power that resides within and when ready release it to combine with the great universal energies and the mantra on this card is i have the power to create and visualize my destiny so that's cool there you go perfect card i for um i think that's wonderfully linked with art itself mm -hmm. you are literally making you are creating something out of nothing yes you know abracadabra i create yeah. what i speak yeah. you know it's just i think there's a cool connection there right yeah i like that for today okay we're gonna talk about the other two paintings i guess that we were actually able to identify in this film mm -hmm. right and thank you thank you david so much he came through this morning <laughs> i was like yeah. hey bro do you got anything else and he was like here you go just a couple little more easter eggs and this first one is called the young girl asleep in a chair by antonio rotari he was an italian painter he was born in 1707 and I guess died in 1762. And this is oil on canvas. And this in the film can be seen hanging on the wall in the main stairway of the Owens house. Most specifically in that scene where Sally is running down the stairs to go, I guess, answer the phone or go get Jillian. It's seen kind of off to the left hand side. And so he has a couple of these sleeping girls, sleeping people. That's creepy. It was his thing. Was that not, yeah. Is that not creepy? It is creepy. And David sent us one that is was so similar, was so, so similar. But in the movie, the woman is wearing a red dress mm -hmm. with a striped shawl, like a transparent striped shawl. Yeah. And I was like, this has to be the same freaking artist. Mm -hmm. Sure enough, it was. This, okay. So we're going to include the actual painting that is hanging in the Owens house. And I'm wondering why they chose this one of a sleeping woman. Mm -hmm. But we're going to learn about Pierto Antonio Rotari. Mm -hmm. He was an Italian painter of the Baroque period, born in Verona. Also, that's where Romeo and Juliet takes place. Hey. So that's really cool. Uh, he received early training in drawing and etching and studied under various masters in Venice and Rome. He developed a style influenced by both Italian and European artists. He gained recognition for his paintings in churches and palaces across Italy and was honored by the Venetian Republic. In 1750, Rotari moved to Vienna to work for Empress Maria Theresa, where he incorporated incorporated the smooth style of Swiss art Jean-Étienne Lyotard. 
He was later summoned to Dresden by King Augustus III, where he became known for his elegant portraits of young women in regional attire depicting various emotions. Empress Elizabeth of Russia invited Rotari to St. Petersburg in 1755, appointing him court painter. He produced numerous character head portraits of young women for the imperial family and aristocracy. Were they all asleep? <laughs> That's so creepy. Oh, I don't know. That's creepy to me. It says various emotions, but literally they're sleeping in all of them. <laughs> One various emotions. Got like real yes. bored of his shit. This does not look like a various emotion to me. I'm sorry. <laughs> Rotari's influence spread across Germany, Poland, and Russia, contributing to an international Rococo style. He also established a private painting academy in St. Petersburg and had significant Russian pupils. Rotari died in St. Petersburg in 1762, where he traveled to paint for the Russian court. He left in 1745 for the church. Yeah, all of his women look like they just got like broken ass necks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so his portraits, mostly of women, are renowned for being beautiful and realistic. Rotari's works were generally limited to royal portraits held by notables such as emperors and court ladies. He was initially a pupil of Antonio Balestra, but moved and lived in Venice from 1725 to 1727. He then joined the studio of Francesco Trevisani in Rome between 1728 to 1732. And between 1731 and 34, he worked with Francesco Sa mm. Salmonella. <laughs> Salamina in Naples. He then returned then to Verona where he started a studio. In 1750 he had moved to Vienna. In 1756 he was invited to Russia by the court of Tsarina Elizabeth Petrovna. Dude, he moved around a lot it seems. From there he moved to Dresden and to work with the court of Augustus III of Poland. He then returned to St. Petersburg to work with the court of Catherine II. He was much in demand as a portraitist and painted royal families in Dresden and St. Petersburg. He also painted the multi-figured altarpieces of the Four Martyrs in 1745 for the Church of Ospedale di San Giacomo in Verona. He also painted an altarpiece of San Giorgio, tempted to sacrifice to the idols in 1743 for the church of the same name, Reggio Emilia, and an Annunciation in 1738 for the main altar for the church of Annunciata in Guastalla. All right, we're going to hop on over to the other painting that is prominent in this film. And, well, not really prominent. It's kind of tucked away, but you got to kind of really pay attention. This one's called The Sisters Eleanor and Rosalba Peel. And this can be seen in the shot of Antonia asking to see Gary's gun when Gary comes to the door in the foyer. This was painted by Rembrandt Peel. His time was between 1778 and 1860. And this is oil on canvas. This painting was done in 1826. And this is a galore image of two of Rembrandt's nine children. It's a lot of freaking kids. That's a lot of kids. Yeah. So he actually paid equal tribute to their sisterly love and to their own embrace of artistic pursuits. Pressed against each other with arms delicately linked, Rosaba Peel and Eleanor Peel Jacobs sit before a tapestry covered table on which a palette and a volume of music rests. The talented Rosaba, a constant aide in her father's work, holds a drawing tool in her hand. Yeah, all nine of his children, out of all of them, several of them be also became artists. Wow. So it seems like they were all very creative. <laughs> What's that lady on TikTok? Everyone's so creative. So creative. Yeah. <laughs> There's an inscribed verse, I guess, on the painting, or I don't know if it's in the painting or on the back of the painting, but it says Rosaba Peel and her sister, Eleanor Jacobs, painted by Rembrandt Peel, and York for New York, 1826, the property of their mother Eleanor Peel. So they are sisters in the painting. So apparently Peel based this composition of David's portrait of the Bonaparte daughters. Bonaparte? Bonaparte? Like yeah. Napoleon Bonaparte? Or David Bonaparte because it says Peel met David while visiting Paris. So maybe David Bonaparte is also an artist. Maybe he okay. idolized okay. him, looked up to him, or like he was inspired by the portraits that David Bonaparte painted of his daughter. So it inspired him to paint his own daughters maybe? Cute. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Thank you. So, a little bit more about Rembrandt Peel. He was an American artist and also a museum keeper. He was a prolific portrait painter. He was especially acclaimed
him for his likeness of presidents like George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Peel's style was influenced by French neoclassicism after a stay in Paris in his early 30s. So a little bit about his early life and education. He was born, like we said before, February 22nd, 1778 in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. There it is. Holy shit. That's where New Hope is, a little town that I love to visit in Bucks County. There you County. go. Yeah, so he is the third of six surviving children. Eleven had died to his mother, Rachel Brewer, and father, Charles Wilson Peel, in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. His father was also a notable artist and named him after the 17th century Dutch painter and engraver Rembrandt. Okay. Van Rijn. Rembrandt Hardmanzoon. <laughs> yeah, Van Rijn? I don't know. His father also... <laughs> I don't know. (laughs) His father also taught all of his children, including Raphael Peel, Rubens Peel, and Titian Peel, to paint scenery and portraiture and tutored Rembrandt in the arts and sciences. Isn't that interesting? His kids, Mm -hmm. Raphael, Rubens, and Titian, Mm -hmm. famous artists. Right. Amazing. Yeah. Initially, when we first started reading about this, I thought this was the actual, like, the Rembrandt that we all know. Mm -hmm. No, they're just hardcore fanning. Got it. (laughs) Okay. Fanning. Yeah, cool. Okay. So Rembrandt began drawing at the age of eight, a year after his mother's death and the remarriage of his father. Peel left the School of the Arts and completed his first self-portrait at the age of 13. The canvas displays the young artist's early mastery. The clothes, however, give the notion that Peel exaggerated what a 13-year-old would look like, and Peel's hair curls like the hair of a Renaissance angel. Aww. Later in his life, Peel often showed this painting to beginners to encourage them to go from bad to better, and it currently hangs in the old senator chamber i guess in congress a little bit about his career in july 1787 charles wilson peel introduced his son rembrandt to george washington and the young aspirant artist watched his father paint the future president in 1795 at the age of 17 rembrandt painted an aged washington making him appear far more aged than in reality the portrait was well received and rembrandt had made his debut In 1822, Peel moved to New York City, where he embarked on an attempt to paint what he hoped would become the, quote, the standard likeness of Washington. He studied portraits by other artists, including John Trumbull, Gilbert Strout, and his own father, as well as his his own 1795 picture, which had never truly satisfied him. His result work, Petre Pater, Completed in 1824 depicts Washington through an oval window and is considered to many to be second only to Gilbert Stewart's iconic Athenium painting of the first president. Peel subsequently attempted to capitalize on the success of what quickly became known as his porthole picture. The Petier Pater? No idea if I'm saying that right. Is Latin for, I'm saying it like it's French. It's not. It's Latin for father of our country. And it was purchased by Congress in 1832 for $2,000. It currently hangs in the old Senate chamber. In 1826, he helped found the National Academy of Design in New York City. Do you know where that is? No. Oh, okay. I feel like you're from there. Like I'm always like my big city friend, you know? Like, you know where everything is. Yeah, I never heard of that. Peel went on to create over 70 detailed replicas, including one of Washington in full military uniform that currently hangs in the Oval Office. Dang! I didn't know this guy was so, like, yeah. esteemed. Right. Peel continued to paint other noted portraits, such as those of the third president, Thomas Jefferson, while he was in office in 1805, and later on a portrait of Chief Justice John Marshall. So noted for his itinerant nature. Is he an itinerant cowboy? Right? Cowboy cop. Peel visited Europe several times to study art. Throughout his life, Peel traveled across the Western Hemisphere in search of inspiration and opportunities as an artist. His father helped pay his way to Paris, where he stayed from June to September in 1808, again in October in 1809. What year was the Moulin Rouge thing? Was that supposed to be like turn of the century, children of the revolution? Like what year? Because that makes me feel like, you know, like the artists just being able to travel the world because they have sponsors, you know, Mm -hmm. that let them travel like that. So I'm thinking of Christian. Yeah, like maybe early 1800s. Again from October 1809 to November 1810. In Paris, Peel studied the works of Jacques-Louis David, which influenced him to paint in the neoclassical style. He painted the famous explorer Alexander von Humboldt and several other noted patrons such as Joseph Louis Gray Lucas and Francois-André Michel. After his success in France, Peel returned to Philadelphia in 1810. 
His efforts to establish his knowledge and mastery of art were displayed in his painting, The Roman Daughter. This one you might recognize, actually. Mm -hmm. From 1811, the painting depicts a young girl shielding her father, a uh, prisoner in chains, and feeding him from her breast, uh, the emblem of Roman charity, quote unquote, mm -hmm. reported in the pages of Pliny. Pliny the Elder. The elder. Oh, right. Okay. That one's pretty popular. Okay. It was deemed too sensational quote unquote, by the people of Philadelphia who were unsympathetic to his endeavors toward, quote, improving the state of fine art in America in the 19th century. Also, it's like a woman breastfeeding an elderly man in jail. Ugh. So, well, it's her, he's dying. I know, like how, what are you gonna do to keep your father alive? You're gonna breastfeed him? <laughs> yes. So cringe though. I know. Amid the economic hardship of the war in 1812, President Jefferson, who promised to buy the 1795 portrait of Washington, could not keep his promise. Instead, encouraged Peel to go to Europe as, quote, we have genius among us, but no unemployed wealth to reward it. That sucks. He went back on his offer to buy. I guess he is also at the Baltimore Museum. He sounds very fascinating. I right? did not know. At the age of 20, Peel married 22-year-old Eleanor May Short at St. Joseph's Catholic Church in Philadelphia during their marriage, Peel and Short had nine children, Rosabella, Eleanor, Michelangelo, Angelica, Emma Clara among them. In 1840, he married Harriet Canny, one of his pupils and an artist in her own right. Rembrandt Peel completed more than 600 paintings. Wow. Yeah. He painted portraits of many notable people, including the American presidents and the chief justice and John C. Calhoun. His paintings are in many public collections. Apparently, around the world it seemed like he painted like a lot of like political dudes do you think maybe do you think he painted the only portrait of a dude in the owens house in the movie could be yeah Okay, so a little bit about the fashion during the reign of Henry VIII. In 1520 to 1529, men and women both began to wear shirts with high standing collars, ending in a frill at the neck and cuff, which would later evolve into the ruff. Dark colors continued to grow in popularity, as did everything oversized among them, cod pieces, gown sleeves, and elaborate headdresses. So a little bit about the women's wear. So in Germany and Hungary, so there's painting that is seen on the sleeves of Princess Sybil of Cleve, um, and she also wears a minutely pleated chemise that closes at the neck with a gold neckband embellished with pearls. Women's wear in Germany remains very similar to that of the previous two decades, though gradually more modest necklines began to appear as they did elsewhere in Europe. Lucas Cronach, the Elder's portrait of Anne Buckner, shows the continuing German enthusiasm for heavy gold chains. Gown sleeves remain narrow, drawing attention to the hands, again, where <gasps> Buckner wears at least 12 rings. Hill comments on this pervasive German trend. He says, In the 1520s and 1530s, matching sets of five rings were worn on various fingers, including the thumb and upper joints. The neckline of her low bodice is filled in by her chemise and a plastron embroidered with pearls. Lacing joins the two sides of the bodice. The sides of the bodice and the cuffs are made of different silk damask from the rest of the gown. We see the same construction in the wedding dress of Queen Mary of Hungary, who married King Louis II of Hungary. Croatia and Bohemia in 1522. The dress is one of only a few surviving 16th century gowns and is made of two different silk damask fabrics with long narrow sleeves. The open bodice is filled in by a pleated chemise ornamented with silver embroidery at the neckline. It's possible Mary would have worn her hair down for her wedding as in Cronache's portrait of Princess Sybil of Cleve. As the Cunningtons know in their Handbook of English Costume in the 16th Century published in 1954, this was the practice in England. I wonder if we can get our hands on this book. Yeah, so they would have long hair flowing loose, the head adorned with a gold fillet, call bilament or wreath, and wore, it, this was worn by the typical hairstyle worn by brides and their attendants, queens at their coronations, as well as young girls. So, How yeah. About a little bit more about the fashion that you see in all those paintings so and that you can buy that book still yeah it's 72 dollars on uh for a hardcover on amazon holy shit okay 
Oh, um, this actually comes from an entire article titled a bit about the fashion during the reign of Henry VIII, and that is on fashionhistory.fitnyc.edu, and we will link that in our show notes if you want to read the entire article, because I just kind of cherry-picked the German and Hungary section that kind of focused more on Sybil of Cleve, but they get into everything from, like, Italian fashion in the Renaissance era, as well as France, England, and I think that, that might have been it, but yeah, there's a lot more more to that article if you guys want to go read that i think i'm gonna get into this article i would just want to know like what happened who was the first woman to like fuck up maybe she was like plucking her eyebrows and then she kind of was like oops 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 and she kept going and that hairline just disappeared because i think that time also they're missing their eyebrows right uh-huh. just to make their heads look bigger to make them <laughs> seem smarter Right? I mean, we do all kinds of crazy stuff in our time. And that, at least, you weren't putting arsenic in your wallpaper or getting impaled by whalebone bodices. Ah, Yeah, that was a little less harmful, right? Yes, yes. But yeah, the bigger, I guess the bigger the head looked, maybe it was associated with a bigger brain. They just were more intelligent, I guess. That's why they were associated with intelligence. I don't know. Um, So why do we think these portraits we kind of touched here and there on it but we there's no like definitive reason why we think these portraits were chosen for this family not saying for the movie they're beautiful they're beautiful for the movie but as a family say they're a realistic family why what would be the connection are they just art lovers lovers of history family connection ancestral connection thievery who knows yeah again lots of time gaps that we just have to like fill in with our own imagination or chat gpt like i don't know (laughs) Yeah, I think I deleted my fan fiction that I had in here. Yeah. But it was something to the effect of like um, Sybil sitting for the painting and Barthel Bruin became her like confidant um, and friend. Ooh, I like that. And I don't, I think I deleted it. Oh, maybe it's in our backup. Okay. But I was trying to figure, oh, get this. I didn't put this in, but it. I was like, okay, have something, have something like intriguing happen. So it had in the story this woman show up to be her like handmaiden, like she's new in court, and come to find that she's like the bad guy. But they named her Serafina. <gasps> I didn't put that in there. ChatGPT just named her Serafina. That's crazy. Isn't that crazy? That's my aunt's name. <laughs> but we also talked about wasn't there a book you were reading yes there was it's about the um biltmore estate in Asheville, yes. north carolina yeah 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 so i just thought that was interesting and it was all about like the book she was holding in the portrait because in the bartho bruin portrait she's holding a book in one hand and she actually is holding some kind of flower in the other hand and it made the flower some kind i think they called it luminaria i was like make the flower something poisonous and something like one of a kind almost like um rapunzel like it has like magical it's like one of a kind is that a real flower they just made that up they it just made that up a luminaria i love that luminaria i know it's really pretty so no fan fiction because i gave up all right how about we can revisit it for the patreon if you guys want a what's his fucking name barney bar Barthel Bruin. Bruin. Do you guys want a Barthel Bruin Sybil of Cleve fan fiction? We'll post it up on the Patreon if you want that. Okay, yeah. I think it... (laughs) We'll do an after hours post. Flower, yeah. I'm gonna see if it's in... I think it's still here in the chat, GBT. Okay, cool. I like that. All right. Um, So, yeah, these paintings, though, just the ones we could talk about today that we had information on have such a crazy range Mm -hmm. of years that they were created from 1533 to 1826. Mm -hmm. I think has such a broad, I put in our notes, like pre-Salem, post-Salem, Georgian era, which is pre-Victorian era. Timeline of the painting. Timeline. Okay. Yeah. So I'm really curious what those other ones are. So yeah. again, guys, all the pictures will be in our show notes. And also you can watch this on YouTube and just, I'm going to put the pictures up for everybody to to see what we're talking about as we're talking. If you have any information, we'd love to do a second one. And look, we thought we weren't going to have enough to talk about. We had too much to talk about, guys. There's more stuff in our notes that we crossed out. Yeah. Still going to be there. But we have been sitting here for four hours. I apologize. I went down the rabbit hole and all no, that. No, don't apologize. All that tea. It was just so juicy. I couldn't help myself. We were, what were we saying the other day? We don't like the drama in our lives, but we don't mind watching a train wreck. <laughs> we can't look. You, you can't look away, you know? Yeah, fiction's fine. Fiction's fun. Whatever. Yeah. You can escape. But this is real history. I, these are real ass people. Yeah. That shit really happened. Mm-hmm. 
She really catfished him via painting, Renaissance painting. Really decapitated his wives I, or ordered them yeah. to be beheaded. And treason. Hmm. God. I'm gonna it. I'm gonna go further down that rabbit hole on my own time and just like I need to know the rest of like all that <laughs> shit. Very exciting. Are we done for today? <laughs> I I think so. I know. That was big. It's even bigger in the notes, so go check those out. Oh, We're going to tell you how to find those right now. All right. So, yeah, that's all we have for you guys today. But just a reminder that you can check out all of the sources pertaining to today's episode via the hero.page link in our show notes. And thanks again to our patron and pal Mirrors for creating this app and keeping creators like us organized. So we have a Patreon. You could find us on patreon.com slash Magnolia Street Podcast if you want to you know, support the podcast for as little as $1 a month. Our ceiling tier gets you access to our patron-only polls where you get to weigh in on what topics you think we should talk about next. It also gets you our monthly calendar so you can see what topics we have coming up for the month. And you get a welcome shout out on the show. For $3 a month, that's our Lavender Bud tier. With that, you get our show notes for each episode in an aesthetically pleasing PDF. Our after hours posts, which me and Christina have plenty of after hours content for this episode. So be sure to check out the Patreon. We have our own paintings. We have our fan fiction. We have stuff. So we're just check it out. If there's any extra tidbits or behind the scenes info pertaining to any of our episode, this is the tier that we'll usually post those along with blog posts or extra photos photos and also you get access to a specially curated spotify playlist we have created playlists for our wmsr episodes as well as production dream playlist for each of our upcoming and past song episodes and more so check out our three dollar tier our five dollar lilac tier gets you access to our private facebook community where we host our monthly live stream plus access to our discord server where we host our monthly watch parties and on the discord server you can join in on the discussion with other magnolia street neighbors via the various interesting channels and threads block party yeah it is a block party over there so go check that out and we have our eight dollar rose tier and this gets you access to extra audio visual content such as a once a month full length episode which again this episode that you're listening to today will be our visual episode of the month you guys get to see all of the extra the paintings the visual references that we have to share along with this episode in a full length visual episode you also get unlimited bonus videos uncut footage cutting room floor footage bloopers outtakes we have a couple meditations up there, exclusive interviews, old home videos from the vault, spell or ritual videos, etc, etc. We have so much content over there on this tier, so this is a great bang for your buck. We also post on their bonus content to coincide with our song episodes, such as full-length demo streams of our original Practical Magic-inspired music, plus lyric sheets, guitar chords, original scratch demos, bonus video performances of our songs, and a lot more. And guys, I'm not gonna spill beans. But I'm just saying, look out for this tier. Look out for this tier. You're going to want to be there. You're going to want to be there. Exactly. Yeah. And just a reminder that the higher the, the tier that you sign up under, the more rewards you get. Because you get all of the rewards of the tiers down below it. So, oh, I didn't mention our Wisteria Vine. That's a great way for you to stay connected with us. And in this tier, we invite you to join our private Marco Polo video messaging app. And this is totally free for both Android and iOS. So sign up with your phone number or email and we will help you do the rest. We'll get you in that chat. There's a few of us. There's a nice little coven going on over there right now. Nice um, nice little, nice little group. And we love to show each other our pets, our gardens, anything else that you like. It's just a great way to chat with each other in a more intimate group setting face to face. So it's totally it's nice. once again patreon.com slash magnolia street podcast if you guys didn't catch that link the first time and you can upgrade or downgrade or cancel at any time but we would really appreciate any support you'd have to throw our way yeah we so got again, merch take it away on the merch we actually just uploaded designs our anniversary poster and t-shirt are now over there and it's like tour style with all of our episodes on the poster and on the back of our t-shirt it also has midnight margaritas on the shirt Plus our logo are in the front, but you can get some of these awesome designs in our Teespring shop that you can access through the Koji link in our Instagram bio. And you can get our original designs on pretty much any kind of apparel, as well as other items like coffee mugs and stickers and tote bags and water bottles. And I love reminding you guys that if you don't see a design 
on an object you like, let us know. I'll make it happen. And the upcoming events, we mentioned Salem. We're going to keep handing it in because while this comes out, we only got about a month left. Mm -hmm. So we're going to be taking over Salem, Massachusetts. We're hosting our Midnight Margaritas meetup on Friday the 13th of October from 9 to midnight. And we will have exclusive merch for this event, a season one poster, and the t-shirt will be available for purchase. And we would be happy to sign for you at this event. And I think afterward, we are going to have a giveaway also. So mm -hmm. keep a lookout for that. The purchase link is live for these now. So just check out our Teespring. They are over there. Um, there's a teaser video for the poster. I'm about to order my t-shirt. I really want to cut the sleeves off of it. It looks so stinking cute. And I want people to be like, hey, what's uh, what's this? What's this? what's you're wearing yeah so if you want a little sneak peek go over to instagram and check out the poster these will only be available for a limited time through november 1st so midnight november 1st gone. Dunzo. Yeah. Dunzo. please rsvp to our event via the event bright link which is where you can also find the updates about the location and the link is going to be in our show notes you can also use our koji link in our instagram bio space is limited please let us know if you're coming so we can let the venue know as well um we have a special little drink lined up for those of you who have that uh e-ticket additional ways you can support the podcast if you don't have the cash is you can listen to us on spotify please give us a star rating we prefer five stars if you could and if you are an apple listener please give us a written review just like songstress with a guitar girl did we would love to shout it out if you're on instagram we would appreciate any reposts or blurbs about our podcast make sure to tag us at magnolia street podcast in your feed and stories posts share us with your practical magic love and friends yeah i think that's everything everything but the kitchen sink all right mm. with two minutes to spare look at that damn all right, man, we have a lot of content to go dump over on that Patreon. Yeah, guys, come check us out. We appreciate you being here. Thanks for your support. I'm Christina. I'm Justina. And we'll see you next time. I like that. Nice. At that house down the street. At that house on Magnolia Street. Would you go down to Magnolia? Street with a wisteria girl wow. and the house of magic and mystery. So, would you go down to Magnolia Street? Do we need to take wit in the old whistle? That reminds me of a uh, spectacular, spectacular. What's his name? The dude that plays Satine's keeper, where he's like. <laughs> Zidla. Zidler, yes, that's that's his name. Yeah, Zidla. 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 I only know him from the borrowers. What else was that man in? I have no idea.